And it's December, and like for all those people in chat, I just want you to know I came really close to wearing a Christmas jumper today. I just didn't feel like it was quite time. <laughs> well, I'm already snowy, and I like it. So. Yeah, <laughs> I like your avatar. It's good. I like that one. And I'm outside for this one. Yeah. <laughs> well, my window broke. Either way, it's apparently snowing in Wales. Uh, even though it fucking, it's definitely not, but it's snowing in my heart. It did snow in Scotland today. I will say that in the central belt, it was like we had we had a slight this dusting of snow, so all public transport, everything just ground to a halt naturally because that's what happens in the UK. Um, yeah, but it was all good, man. But uh, yeah, we are like we're kind of a week behind, I think, with these open bars because you know there's a bunch of stuff we were all up to last week and we couldn't do it, so we had to just delay it by a week, and that's. That's unusual, but here we are. So yes. we're into December, and it's all good, man. So how are you feeling, anyway? No, oh, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm, I'm ready to have a. It feels nice and cozy walking into the open bar and getting ready to talk about the wonderful media that gets released. You know, nothing, nothing shitty from what I hear. You know, great. Oh, TV, and it's nothing, nothing but quality movie. all the way, man. <laughs> great commentary from famous people around the world about movies and media. It's gonna be great. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be fantastic. Yeah, I think we've got some great stuff to cover. And hey, we've got some fine gentlemen here in to help us. So shall we bring them in? Sounds good. Yes. All right, we've got Disparu, who's, uh, well, he's a regular on this channel almost at this point. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, always good to be back. We've had Scotsmen, Welshmen, now Englishmen, both coming and talking about the weather. Uh, I actually had a parcel today. He was like, yeah, we'll, we might deliver it today, or maybe it's next week, because uh, the weather conditions are a bit bad. You look out the window, it's just minus numbers, but that's enough for people to go, I kind of don't want to work today, so it, it's a bit cold. It's a bit nippy. Yeah, no, not even a chance of snow, but even the slightest hints that maybe it will, and it's just a load of people going, today's a day off. Yeah. Oh, I better play it safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to go in. Unfortunately for my day off, I had to watch episode three of Willow, so, you know, another day, another childhood property destroyed. It's typical oh, Hollywood at the moment. We'll, we'll get to Willow, believe that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we'll bring in our next guest as well. Um, this making his debut on the open bar is Magog. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Hey. Good, man. Well, um, yeah. Well, it's, uh, is, it, is it Magog or is it Magog? I'm not sure how I should say it. Uh, it's Magog. Uh, that's the character I play on my channel, but um, my real name's Jeremy. <laughs> so <laughs> you <just> <laughs> no, you're ruining the illusion, Jeremy. man. You're ruining it. <laughs> uh, it's it's I was boxed years ago. I put it on my intros. It's like created by Jeremy. Well, yeah, you know, man, I like own my shit. That's a, that's, a, that's a fantasy joke right there. Like I am right. Magog, the demon lord. I was like, you can call me Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they call me Tim. You know, very threatening. Monty Python joke. Come on, yeah. I'm the high fantasy guy that does like high fantasy comedy. I dress up like a stupid wizard. Eh, you know. I you, you, well, I almost expected you to be in full like wizard garb, you know, because uh, that shit looks uh, pretty effective when I see it in your videos. You got like potions I, over there and shit. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah glowing, glowing I, I potions. Like and, uh, yeah. yeah, the flail and the shields. It's like you're ready to go at any moment. If there's a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> it's like you're the one. That... <laughs> yeah, this is what I've been so training it's... for my whole life. Well, I, I also have this wonderful bag of sun-dried goblin dicks. That... <laughs> nice. <laughs> there in the old magic shop. There's a lot of power within the goblin piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's yeah, the secret I, to eternal youth. Right. So yeah, I, I, I'm trying to do like little movies. I got away from the commentary, like the politics and stuff, and wanted to do more focus on my comedy and creating something that kind of, I guess, competes with the crap that's coming out now. Or at least I'm trying. <laughs> I mean, it's not hard to be fair because what's coming out now isn't comedy. It's like 
politically yeah. safe like fucking propaganda so yeah if you're prepared to just have fun and offend people you'll probably do all right yeah i'm, I'm pretty offensive in my comedy a lot of a lot of offensive jokes because i was inspired by a lot of uh like mel brooks and uh monty python and black adder red dwarf growing up with like british tv and and all those kind of comedy movies i love that stuff and that's gone away now you can't make stuff like that anymore you can't make mel brooks these days you can't yeah no no mm -mm. Uh, but no it was um it was through count dankula that i got to acquainted with you um because he, he mentioned that you were you were interested in coming on the stream and i thought well i'll get in touch and see if he wants to do it and uh, here we are so it's all good man thank you for coming on yeah thank you for having me and uh yeah well um we've obviously i know you're <laughs> you're a fan of the original willow so we will talk about that very soon yeah. <laughs> um and we've got chris gore coming on soon as well who's um who's going to give us his insights on avatar but <laughs> before we begin that how about a bit of light comedy gentlemen <laughs> it's like i'm ready for it I'm i have ready. uh well um what can i say um yeah, there was an actress recently who decided to give an interview for Variety and, uh, you know, share her thoughts about the world of um, action heroes and, uh, you know, where, where women have been represented in it and, uh, well, how she was an absolute trailblazer because before her, um, there weren't there weren't any. So we should be terribly thankful for her. But, uh, well, I, I won't uh, I won't steal her thunder. I'll just put it, I'll, I'll put her words out there and uh, let you make your own judgments. So just give me a second, I'll bring this one up. Sweet. Doing Hunger Games. Nobody had ever put a woman in the lead of an action movie yeah. because it wouldn't work, <laughs> we were told. Girls and boys can both identify with a male lead, but boys cannot identify with a female lead. Oh, absolutely. And it <laughs> makes me so happy every single time I see a movie. I love how she says that with a straight face. Absolutely. goes through every single one of those beliefs and proves that it is just a lie to yeah. keep certain people out of the movies, to keep certain people in the same positions that they've always been in. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> she had the best reaction to that. <laughs> what? But seriously, when I saw this on my timeline, and I, was, I was like, oh, great, what's the thing? Get it out. And I listened to it, I was like, no. She's not seriously, yeah. like, no. You, you. This has got to be a fucking bait. Like, how could you... Come on. <laughs> I, I, as well, like, of all the hills to die on, like, of all the examples to hold up of fantastic female action heroes, fucking Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. Like, Dude, nobody really cares about Katniss anymore. Like, really? No. She's, she's going to have an no. endearing, like, enduring, sorry, legacy. Like, certain other characters that I guess don't exist, because... <laughs> um, I'll play devil's advocate. Is there a chance she was born... Like in a hole somewhere, like in the desert. Well, or... No, I think that's actually a good point because, like, most people, if you're doing something, you you kind of um, experience other things around you. Like, I watch loads of YouTube videos because I think you can learn a lot from other people. And if you watch my stuff, you can definitely like, sort of pick out the influences or what I watch from what I do because you kind of imitate what you like. Um, and sure. I don't think she's watched other movies. Like, I genuinely no. think she just has no idea. Like, she doesn't experience anything. She probably doesn't watch her own stuff. She films them, gets paid, and moves on. And so, this is what she believes. It's, it's... Can we rule out that she's reincarnated and she had actually played all female actresses previously, and so thus her, her statement is technically correct? Even I don't think we can like, definitively like, rule that time. out. <laughs> Yeah, she, she goes all the way back to Eve. She's just all of women. And so... I, just, I, I just think... Um... <laughs> Yeah, because I parodied this in, like, one of the first videos I did on this channel, just, like, making fun of, like, Captain Marvel and, like, oh, you know, thank God we finally got a strong female action hero because we've never had this before. And, like, going through, like, the decades and decades of awesome female characters that we've had. And then, yeah, it was it was a complete mockery. But then you get something like this where it's like, oh, God, they're actually still clinging to that narrative, are they? Like, yeah. you know, like, before 2012, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a single decent female-led action movie you know now, like... now everybody who argues against this point always goes with like the ones that everybody knows like you know ellen ripley from alien you know you have uh, linda hamilton in terminator but yep. what about like like gina davis long kiss goodnight cutthroat yep. island you know like even mila jovovich from the resident those. evil yeah. movies like yeah. right 
uh, uh, Fifth Element. That was an action film, um, you know, sci-fi action. You know, uh, there's plenty of examples beyond the the really famous ones. Like Willow is one of those, and I know we're gonna get to Willow, but I mean, Bav Morda was a bad bitch, right? Like that was an awesome lead. So yep. was Sorsha. Like I mean, there's plenty. Well, of even examples. in the sword and sorcery genre, you had like Red Sonja. Uh, by Bridget Nielsen, you know, yeah. you, you had um, uh, Bo- well, you had Valeria Grace... from the original Conan movies. Like you, you had yeah. all kinds of characters like that. You had Grace Jones, who was both female and black, and she was in Conan the Destroyer. Yeah, right? she was and mildly she was... terrifying. Yeah, she was. She was awesome. You know, she'd always find yeah. a way to like get rid of this point though like anything you mentioned to it well they're not actually the lead they're not the main character well they're just a side character but they're just in it a lot like i just the amount of clarifiers she added in the it's, could... it's so yeah it's so narcissistic to think that you're the first generation that that pioneered anything that you're the one who like you blazed the trail that everyone else is going to follow it's like you did fuck all like you produced a a, tri- a trilogy of movies aimed at like 14 year old girls you know, it's all just YA novel garbage. Like nobody, nobody looks back on Katniss Everdeen and, and puts her up sit up there with Ellen Ripley or Sarah Connor or Marion right. from from you know Raiders. Um, she's not in the same league, but it's like just that weird self-important, self-aggrandizing nonsense that you just you thought we were past that, and so apparently we're not. Feels like a complete backfire because like the first. She, I, I would want to tell her. I'd be like, "You understand? You you look like a clown. Like everyone thinks you don't know about these very famous, very enjoyed, very culturally important movies." And she'd probably be like, "I, I know about them." And be like, "Yeah, but people think you don't now." Like, yeah. yeah. And to be honest with you, nice disrespect to so many great actresses over the years. <laughs> like, I I think um, there's an element as well of like you know Jennifer Lawrence is like not really a thing anymore. <laughs> like. Not really. Four no. or five years ago, when she did Passengers, I think that was the high water mark for her. When she got like twenty million, right. and it's like, okay, that was when she seemed like a bankable star, and that flop. She's been in like nothing but flops since then, and yeah, she's she's not really an A-lister anymore. And it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna pretend that like I was this massive influential force in cinema when I really wasn't. I just lucked into a role that like happened to be inexplicably successful, but that was it's like true. It's even more than that, though, because, like, she's got, coming from a position of, like, this is the only kind of belief system which allows people who are, like, live the heist life their entire life. These are people who have literally everything, but they can still be oppressed. And she's like, well, I was oppressed. Nobody else had done anything I had, but I'd still managed to overcome everyone else in the industry and lead the kind of path. And it's like, you were literally paid millions from your first role. <laughs> like, at yeah. no point, I've right. never been excluded from anything, but you still oh. think, no, I, I'm the one who's been hard done by my entire life. It's, it's an astronomical Can, does she Does movie. she yell at her vagina at night? You are holding me back! Yeah, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's funny, but like, yeah. I mean, pretty much all of us can just like put it aside and just dismiss it as the the idiotic comments of someone who doesn't know any better. But yeah, I, ten years ago I would have expected that from her. I thought she might have been a bit more savvy at this point, but apparently not. Uh, well, isn't but... it even more important? Like as your popularity wanes, they tend to play even more towards the victim because that way it's like, no, you have to employ me, otherwise you're a horrible person. So. I think this is more of an attempt to get more roles than anything else to try and stay I'm... relevant in some way, even if people. If it's for the wrong reasons. I mean, it could be. It could also be that, like, give her a few more years and she'll start playing the, uh, well, I'm over, you know, a certain age card, you know, and you're not casting me anymore because there's no mm. rules for mature women. Uh, it's like, yeah, Scarlett Johansson is probably going to end up playing that card as well when she hits 40. Um, but, yeah, you, you, I guess you use whatever's in your arsenal, I suppose, and that's what they've got, like, guilt. Uh, but hello, Chris. I'm sorry we didn't like introduce you properly, but I'm glad you were able to to make it in. Uh, thank you, Drinker Mahler. Good to see you. Hey, Dis- Disbrew, love the new haircut. My God. Oh, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Cosplaying Willow. No, yeah. I, I love, <laughs> well, kids out of Willow. But look, I, <laughs> your expectations are so high for Hollywood actors. They're not the brightest bulbs in the bunch. I mean, there's a reason directors refer to actors as meat puppets. Right. I mean, they're just and especially when just the general populace has a knowledge of movies that goes back five years, 10 years at best. So it's sort of 
uh, that comment doesn't surprise me, but what I love is all the Twitter corrections and, and just this conversation here. So, um, yeah. Opportunity to talk about, you know, so many, well, great, I, you know, it's awesome. I, I've met people who are in like drama class in school. If that's their mentality, just they're rich now, then yeah. Celebrities are fucking morons. Uh, <laughs> <that's> true. <laughs> true. No, I, I, I've met them there. <laughs> there's very few I've met that have impressed me um, that, that actually have a knowledge of the craft or no film. So yeah. Of course, I'm speaking in like the modern times. I'm, I'm sure there's been plenty of actors who are also brilliant at other things. You know, like I what was it? Uh, Dolph Lundgren has like a what? He's like a chemical he's got, engineer. He's got a or PhD something. in chemical yeah. engineering. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it, it, I'm 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 generalizing, and I shouldn't, but you know, you you kind of get my point. There's uh, there's a certain kind of mindset it takes to be like on stage and be an actor but at the same time it doesn't call for a lot of i don't know like philosophical thinking <laughs> i think i think different actors have different level of commitment like if daniel day lewis was going to play a lawyer i think he would actually go and pass his bar exam right. just to like play the role um, i know right Dan daniel day lewis is one of, what do they call it method acting i mean didn't he spend yeah. an entire year as abraham lincoln before he even done the film like an Damn. entire year Walking around with that hat on, <laughs> you know, growing his beard out, talking like Abraham Lincoln. That's how committed to a role he is. And that's why all his movies end up amazing. Yeah. But then he, he does like one every 10 years or something. And that's pretty much right. him. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was going to ask Chris, because um, I know you've you've not got a huge amount of time. And I wanted to make use of you, sir, because sure. I know you've been and seen Avatar 2. And... Man, I've heard conflicting things about this. Um, some people say it's glorious and it's it's uh, James Cameron absolutely nailing it, and other people have said it's garbage. And well, I'd just love to hear your take on it, really. Well, um, before that, I have to compliment you on the video that you posted this morning. Incredible breakdown of everything wrong with Marvel right now. At this point, <laughs> also, no, that that video is fantastic, um, like a mini documentary with your 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 rant but but um i don't see how they pivot from from you know uh the corner they back themselves into i i don't know where they're going to be able to pivot from everything they've set up this sort of meandering phase four so i, I just i'm just encouraging everyone watching the stream you have to watch this video drinker posted a couple couple hours ago i think um yeah. so good so thanks man yeah, just had to tell you. Uh, but everything you're hearing about Avatar is true. And by true, I mean it is both. It is both god awful, horrible dialogue. The dialogue is so bad. I was in a movie theater that seated 500 people. I was in the theater with 20 people. The publicist had to come in to tell us to stop laughing because <laughs> the dialogue is so Damn. bad. <laughs> oh god awful the james cameronisms are just all there on display the drawn out ending where the villain's defeated no he's not the villain's defeated no he's not the villain's no. defeated no he's not um it's it's like cameron threw through all of his best films or most popular films into a blender and used all the elements of all of them from aliens to titanic to the abyss to the first avatar it's like i'm just going to use a little bit of everything and it's the story is stupid some of the logic gaps there is a logic gap at the end that is a a spoiler but it is the dumbest thing i mean i was just i'm sitting talking to friends and we we walk we all walked out of the movie and said that was stupid that was awful the plot was terrible and i want to see it again because it was such a visceral experience and, and also this is because it's been such a terrible year at the movies. This mean, and not just for mainstream blockbuster popcorn films, but also for awards films or films that could be taken seriously as, uh, you know, dramas and whatnot. But it's been an awful, awful year at the movies. This movie almost stands in contrast to everything else. And that's the reasons that I liked it in spite of all the things you're going to be able to nitpick this forever. There's so much bad stuff in it. And at the same time, 
the action is glorious. Uh, it, it actually it doesn't resolve everything. Uh, it, it, by the end, it doesn't necessarily set up part three, but you see the conflict that's the conflict is just there. It's, you know, there's there's more to come. Right. But also it's uh, Top Gun Maverick stood out this year as like a movie that like, hey, that's like it was made in a bubble without all this nonsense that we're inundated with effectively right. agenda, agenda trumping storytelling. Now, I will say this. The movie is while the last film was about um, uh, colonizers plundering resources, unobtainium. This film is about specifically about whaling. And there no. are <laughs> seriously there are whalers from Earth drilling into the brains of uh, uh, creatures of Pandora to obtain something else. I'm not going to get into spoilers. <laughs> Actually, you're going to say unobtainium is in their brains. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, like, so, so the thing is this, I'm sitting here like, I know with my brain this is a terrible film and I'm enjoying it. Now, the other thing that's interesting, it's also partially a YA novel. It focuses on the, the children of Jake Sully as two boys and two girls. So it's almost like a coming of age on Pandora kind of thing. And the reason that I believe this film will be incredibly successful is because it does what so many of the movies this year didn't do. It's relatable. It's about a family with a strong patriarch, like not a father who's made to be an idiot. He is the patriarch. He is the father of this family and he will do anything to protect his kids and his kids act like kids of a teenage age. They have to move from the forest to integrate with the reef people, reef Pandorans. And that's, that's a source of conflict. And there are many things that are just simply relatable, you know, um, bullying, having a crush on a girl, um, conflict, uh, father son relationships. I haven't seen a functional healthy father son or family dynamic in a movie and i can't remember when hollywood doesn't know how to make it but but cameron did it and as a father to a son and a father to a daughter i'm looking at this going like i think this is going to be a really popular family film and it's very family right it's a family adventure movie that maybe disney would have made decades ago so in spite of there's so many dumb things i can't wait to talk to you about it like there's just stuff that's objectively just terrible. I mean, James Cameron's strength was never dialogue. Um, but it's like he designed all the action sequences and said, oh, I guess they should talk. Um, <laughs> and throw that in there. That, that's sort of brief. I mean, if you want to ask me questions, I'm happy to answer whatever. But uh, I'm actually, I already have tickets to see it again next week. And I, I want to see it with a real audience, right? Like a paying audience. Yeah, not. The, not it sounds like you're in, a, in an, an unusual position with this. Like you're, oh, what so. you're telling me both like intrigues me and like drastically horrifies me, because it, it really seems like a soap opera, just writ large with an enormous budget and and crazy special effects. Yeah, yeah. Like you've got the family moving to a new area and they don't like the new, their the kids don't like their new environment and they get probably bullied or something. They got yes. conflict with the local kids. Um, you know the the parents have got to try and hold their their family and their relationship together, and oh man, and it's all it's all framed in this context of like blue Smurf people on an alien planet. <laughs> well, that's oh. but see, I, I feel like it's going to be teetering right on the brink of absurdity. It, 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 first of all, you are correct, and every criticism that I've seen, I'm like, oh, I agree with all of that, and I, it's just so they're just parts. You're just like. That's why we were laughing so hard watching the movie. It's ridiculous. Having said that, this is like a movie Hollywood used to make, and there'd be 10 of these movies come out, and then you would judge them and go, well, this one is much better than that or whatever. But there's literally been two movies like this that have come out this year, Top Gun Maverick and Avatar 2. That's it. And everything else is this pounding the agenda into your head. Or as you are, I can't even say the <clears throat> message without saying it the way you say it, drinker. And doing a little shout out, I don't know. I would like to, I would here. like to add one movie to your list. Didn't the Northman come out this this year? And it was true, true. It was good, but, that, but that's not a broad appeal film. That's not a popcorn movie. That's yeah. I would put that in the category more of an art film, which I also happen to really, really enjoy. Um, but it, but look, Top Gun Maverick, like like I say, oh yeah, know, what that movie did. This is kind of like that in the sense that 
it's made by a, a, a craftsman, a brilliant filmmaker who can't write dialogue. <laughs> Cameron has his strengths. Although I'm told that like four people worked on the screenplay, how the movie had this bad a dialogue is kind of shocking to me, but whatever. Um, but it's, I, it's, I always thought with with Cameron movies, like well, especially like in his heyday and like the the late eighties, early nineties, like his dialogue was serviceable. It, it wasn't spectacular, but it was like fine. It didn't make me cringe or anything. But like, yeah, what you're describing seems like he's he's almost like George Lucas with the prequels. He's almost got too much creative control now, and there's no one to rein him in and help him out. And like, right. this is what you get. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. Additionally, the movie's three hours and ten minutes, and oh, it man. um. Christ. It's it, what what it felt like to me is it felt very episodic in the beginning. Like each thirty minutes kind of has a big conflict that resolves, or that like the story moves on from. So it felt like I watched six episodes. I binged six episodes of a streaming series. That's what it felt like watching the film. I didn't mind it though. That's what I'm. I'm kind of shocked at my own reaction, just because. And I think my reaction is liking it maybe more than I should, only because. Everything else is so bad. We are literally, if there's an if there's an opposite of the Renaissance or the Golden Age, we're living it now. I mean, seriously, it's we're in the dark ages of film. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. We've, I mean, we've uh, we've entered the event horizon of a creative black hole. Hundred percent. There's just like so many lapses in logic, and there are characters that are just terrible. There's this character that is like a feral human that lives with them that looks like. I probably did. None of you remember this Chaka from Land of the Lost. Just straight oh up, God. Chaka oh God. from Land of the Lost. Thank you, my God. Thank you, my God, for remembering that. Um, but it, yeah, no, it's just terrible character. But at the same time, in spite, it's almost like there's parts of it like so bad. You're like, but I'm still, I'm laughing. I'm getting a reaction. You know, I saw Strange World. Never laughed once. Didn't care. What a god awful film from Disney. Um, right. I, I think. But I, I was going to ask because, like, the things that you said you liked were things like, well, there's a father's relationship, family. It's a family movie. There's a patriarch. There's people and actually nice people for once, rather than everything else. Y you seem to be comparing it a lot relationally to other movies that we've had in recent times, rather than right. this is just an a movie on its own. If you know what I mean. Yes. Do Do you think you're giving it? points for stuff that basically should be a baseline oh right. no no 100 percent i am because i see a lot i go to the movies every week i probably see um mi like maybe eight to ten films a week a lot of indie movies that none of you have heard of so a brilliant documentary if i could throw out a recommendation um who am i and it's a documentary about the doctor who feature film that premiered on fox in the 90s no mm -hmm. one remembers this and it uh, follows the screenwriter going to Gallifrey One, which I've attended uh, for years. So uh, the point is there's always other choices out there, right? Uh, so I see a lot of movies. The Hollywood movies just tend to just be god awful. Uh, and, and you know, some highlights here and there. I, I actually quite liked Barbarian. That was very good. Um, uh, the horror film. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Uh, That's but, pretty interesting. Yeah. But I'm absolutely giving it points because there is actively it seems to be an agenda against including a nuclear family in a film. And this is why to me, the failure of the Buzz Lightyear uh, Pixar movie and the, and the, you know, strange world more recently, the failure of those films sends a message and the success of this film could send a different message, which is more of this, less of that. And I, and I think I, we find ourselves in a difficult position though, because it's almost like, okay, do we go for like a bad movie that that produces you know the basically the destruction of any kind of traditional values and the replacement of them with nothing at all um right. basically the message or do we go for a really mediocre film that that uh you know still espouses those those values that that used to be like endemic to cinema that used to be so popular but it's fundamentally not a very good film and it's like it's almost like the lesser of two evils here. And it's like from a guy like James Cameron who took 13 years to make this film, I, I guess I just right. expect more. I expect this right. to be fucking spectacular because if you take this long and invest this much money in a film like this, 
you you really need to deliver. You're setting a hell of an expectation for audiences, and it sounds like it's kind of not there. But this is not the result we were hoping for, is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no. And look, this is this is also to be clear. This is for normies. I don't think I don't think it's for I don't think it's for us. This movie is for normies. It really is. It's it's for normies and it's for families. And on that level, that you know, knowing that that's what he's setting up, and it also felt like it felt like in many ways at the beginning, it's like cowboys and Indians, and we're on the Indian side, and they're Pandorans. It just it just had that kind of vibe of like you know the old frontier and whatnot. But there yeah, are just Pocahontas in space. That's all. Right. It's just well, John Smith and Pocahontas. I mean, it, it was almost beat for beat. Well, the first movie is Dune. The first movie is beat for beat. It's the first Dune novel, frankly. Right. Um, um, and then where it goes here is, and he did also uh, shoot both two and three back to back. And I guess they're just completing four. We're talking about photography, not like the digital. Because uh, right. you're seeing a cartoon. You're seeing a cartoon. Everything, yeah, you're everything is digital, with the exception of some of the actors. Um, the woman who names whose name is, escapes me, she plays a general um, of this base, and it's uh, she plays Tony Soprano's wife. I can't even think of her name. Oh, damn! Uh, you can picture her face. In any case, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, like, look, I, I feel like I've been dragged myself through the desert, and uh, this is a glass of water, so to speak. But I, I can't sit here with a straight face and tell you there aren't some of the stupidest things I've seen in a movie in a long <laughs> time. Especially something that happens at the end that I had to point out to some of the other critics there. I said, you realize, and I just had to point out a logic thing that made no sense. Maybe they'll try to fix it in the follow-up movie. But this pretty much takes takes place right after the events, the events of the first film. I just I'm just curious. I, but again, this is not the Avatar. It is it's a movie. It's sort of like why is something like Cirque du Soleil in Vegas, you know, uh, popular <laughs> right. with families? It's a dumb light show with acrobats, but it appeals right. to everyone. And why is there sort of no cultural footprint, with the exception of a theme park area in Disney World for Avatar? You know, which is a very popular. I've never been, but it, um, according to Drunk Three PO, it's very popular. He has a whole. He has a Pandora channel. I, I yes. I've I've been through Pandora in Florida and like yeah the the lines for like the flight of the Navi and stuff are crazy like you're basically gonna have to give up your whole day just to wait on that one fucking ride so if that's your bag then fine like it's not it's so for weird me but all of that's a thing because I, I just like Avatar was just dead to me for so long <laughs> this yeah. this is uh, I guess what I want your take on Chris is like. You know, the first movie kind of hit that sweet spot. Like, it was able to capitalize on 3D, which was just a real craze at the time. It was visually very impressive because, you know, we hadn't seen something of that scale before. But none of that is going to, like, hit home anymore. We've had a million visually amazing movies in that time period. Um, and 3D is not a thing anymore. Like, do you realistically see this getting to, like, the same level as the previous film? Like, hitting that, like, $2 billion mark? It, it uh, I think it has the potential. I didn't think that before I walked in. Before I walked in the theater, I thought, mm. I'm, I'm about to walk into a shit show. I'm dreading seeing this. I don't want to sit through this for three hours. I did urinate twice, so I might have missed a plot point here and there. But um, I, I, I was surprised in spite of its enormous flaws. And I would say that it is... It is uh, uh, it's not as good as the first one. So whatever you thought about the first one, whatever your personal ranking was for it, you might want to knock it down a peg or two. Fuck, and, man. And that's real beat. No, I'm serious. And, you know, but like I say, when I'm watching this movie, I'm going, oh, this isn't even for like sci-fi or genre fans. It's for, it appeals to everyone. Now, hear me, hear me out through my logic. Um, oh, and this is kind of a funny observation too. All of the earth people that have come there to kind of, you know, plunder the resources of Pandora, they're nearly all white, with the exception of one Asian woman. There's one Asian woman in this movie. Is she a scientist? Uh, no, no. <laughs> She's uh, among the warrior men. There are, and there, oh. are good, there are good humans and there are bad humans. I'm not saying they're all bad. They're not all bad. They're good ones and bad ones. But um, this movie is going to open internationally. It's going to translate internationally. Have you ever seen like international films that are terrible and you're like, why did Highlander 2 make so much money? Um, 
I thought that at the time. <laughs> I saw Highlander 2 in the theater and I thought it was god awful. It didn't do too well in America, but it did incredibly well internationally at the time it was released. There are just terrible movies that come out and they they have a universal appeal. This what I'm telling you is what I'm trying to explain is this movie has a universal appeal to families who have literally had no movies to go to this year, including the movies that would traditionally appeal to that audience are terrible and and no one's going to see them because i think people doesn't tr people don't trust disney anymore they just don't i mean i know i don't and if my kids were single digit age they would not be exposed to anything disney because i don't trust them um, i i uh, yeah i totally get what you're saying there and i can see why this would end up being a success just purely because any port in a storm kind of situation right. um at the same time it's a really shit movie. Uh, sorry, it's a really shit reason for a film to be massively successful. It's just like, well, it's the best of a horrible bunch, you know. And it, right. it's the one film that that gives us what well, that doesn't like absolutely berate us and hate like the the, the idea of a family going to see movies. Isn't it, I'm isn't sure it kind of strange what you're uh, what you're telling us about the whole family dynamic and everything? Because didn't James Cameron recently like tweet out that testosterone is a toxin yeah, that needs to was. be? He was completely misquoted. Yes. Was it misquoted? Which, okay. which is, first of all, I know these he journalists. Was not risk taking. Here, the, 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 these journalists here, they will set you up. They all come in with an agenda. They're looking for clickbait quotes. And they, all, all, you know, the thing is, it's sort of like navigating the threading the needle where you're not giving the journalists exactly what they want because they definitely want something clickbaity. What he was talking right. about is when he goes out on these seafaring adventures, I mean, James Cameron's actually gone like in the deep sea. You know, he's yeah. Well, this dude's Titanic. been like to see the Bismarck and the Titanic and shit. Yeah. Like he's been yeah. right to the bottom of the ocean. He, I mean, he, he's been to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. I mean, he's broken records. I mean, let's face it, filmmaking is like a hobby to him. His real passion is the ocean. And he's on. You know? He's around a lot of testosterone fill, filled maleness. Something the state of California is sadly lacking currently. Um, <laughs> uh, I, live, I live in this oasis of pasadena california which is like uh very very uh conservative and blue collar simultaneously but so what cameron the full quote was effectively talking about him going on these adventures coming back home to his kids and he still acted like he was on one of those he had to kind of like dial back and like you got to be dad now you're not like right okay you know, i get i get it so, so it's kind of like when you're in the military you go off to you go off to downrange and all kinds of languages used because I, I i went downrange and i come back and i had to I had to turn that off because you're not well, part of the boys club anymore you're, you're back home you gotta you know it, exactly exactly so um that's the full context of that quote i just never trust when i, I mean i've been misquoted many times although i wasn't misquoted on the recent tweet i put out Make Marvel male again if you go to like <laughs> You made a lot of people <laughs> big mad with that one, son. Yeah. T shirts. We're gonna make that was you? Uh, that was hold on. I gotta follow that. I followed yeah, you. Yeah. Of... yeah. It's so funny that the people that were like properly offended by it, it's like, oh, I used to I used to follow you, Chris. Now you betrayed me. I have to I unfollow I could, you. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Like these are people that I know, like, you know, you can text me, DM me. Or call me these are people i've physically you know hung out with so i don't know just uh true colors came out and um a, a sort of my i think it's a pretty mild comment after one million times of seeing someone tweet the future is female or the force is female i'm just looking for a little little equity a little equal equal footing right yeah so whatever yeah. i was just trying to be funny i literally was just trying to think like ah fuck this popped well, into my head. Twitter's not a real place, so you can do, huh. you know, you should be able to do what you want, jokes and everything, but yeah. people take Twitter so seriously. Yes, and people were asking me, people I know were asking me to delete the tweet. First of all, I would never presume to tell Disparu or Mahler or any of you, like, what you should tweet, what you should not tweet, or to delete it. Like, I got too much shit to do. I'm not going to police you. You say what you want. It's freaking cool. Right. I like diversity of opinion. I love that. But yeah, no, I, I think yeah. you know. I think what's interesting though is like this tweet obviously kind of went viral and like got a lot more attention than maybe you would get normally, and it's because a lot of people agree with you. But when that happens, like obviously the the 
flip side of that is then a lot of people catch wind of it and they're like, oh my god, a person's expressing an opinion which goes against the message. We must destroy him now. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just to change... uh, so predictable. Yeah, if, if you're trying to change like an entire culture, it, culture is essentially just it's a perception that we all agree on. We agree that these values are important, and so we all kind of behave around them. And so if someone's actually coming out against them, you can't have that because you're trying to change something. So if everyone else knows that actually no other people think this and they all agree with it, then you can't change it. So you have to eradicate any other person that disagrees with you just in case it inspires sort of the um, confidence that that opinion is the right one. But Stay on program. Well, like humans yeah, are herd animals, aren't they? Ultimately, yeah, and like whatever like, way the herd's going, like the rest of them will just follow. When it comes to reality, time. perception is reality, is actually true. The only reason we have a culture is because we all get together and agree that that's the best one. And so you, that's why they're so against alternative opinions. But Avatar, I am really looking forward to the FNT discussion, uh, your discussion, because there's so much to pick apart and rip apart on this thing. And and I look, just because I've been around for so long, I can't tell you that the the number one movie at the box office, which is something that studios use as a piece of marketing, right? It's number one at the box office. Doesn't That doesn't translate to quality. That's not a barometer of quality. And when you look at past box office, uh, there have been so many bad films that were number one at the box office or made a lot of money Money is money is not um, does not equal quality. That's and so uh, while I personally believe I think this is going to resonate with normies and it's going to be successful and it's going to be successful for reasons I think people will find unexpected. The relatability of a family going through strife um, and and a, a family you know just going through really simple things that everyone can relate to. That's why I think that internationally this movie is going to be a huge hit because it's a cartoon and you can just dub the voices right like it's I, I don't think anyone cares about the voice actors i mean maybe in the u.s people care kate wins i didn't even know kate winslet did a voice uh she does a voice of one of the um young girls but it's it's um uh it's a cartoon that is has a broad simple non-offensive message it's the filmed version of cirque du soleil and in, in vegas it's going to broadly appeal and you are going to eviscerate it when it comes out. There are really specific things that are just so not just things that are just bad and don't work, but, um, but then there are things conversely that like there's some action sequences. You're like, damn, why can't, and this is the other thing that uh, that's worth noting is Ryan Coogler should be humiliated and embarrassed at his undersea world. Takalaka or whatever it was. What's it called again? <laughs> or something. I don't know. I, actually don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, it looks like they were defecating in there because it was so brown, like cloudy sea and dark. Uh, well, I think they probably were defecating there because, like, when you think about it, flush toilets don't work underwater. So right, it just it just it was just it was just bad. Not only bad CG, but just just sort of bad, just in terms of a vision of a functioning, realistic undersea world, or just a functional, fictional, you know place it would just i just i i can't we kind of forever is terrible but um yep. not to yep. mention the fact they just should have recast the child yeah stupid yep. choice. Chad, have done what chad Boseman. Boseman actually wanted yeah. them to do yeah. correct correct but it so so you compare that we've just seen another underworld blue people movie and you see this and uh just the way this looks is just much better the storytelling is is very i i really feel don't don't bet against Cameron. Do not bet against James Cameron. He knows how to make things appeal to lots of people. It may be the stupidest thing you've ever seen. It may be dumb when it comes to, if you, you, you take it one step further, the logic falls apart. And all of that, I believe, is true, having seen the film and really wanting to get into specifics with you. But I, I'd rather, you know, we can save it for next week if you want to have me back. or uh, you, oh, you'll, be able to. To it, you'll be able to pick it apart yourselves because there's so much stuff that is just like, you know, either cringe or, you know, just you're just going to like put your hands over your face and just go, what the hell are you? And and at the same time, I'm thinking that's re th th that action scene is really badass or that's a cool concept. And there are other things that are just stupid. So, um, um, so I mean, I'm in I'm in like this weird place where it's like, 
the spectacle caught up in that spectacle like a show but it's but knowing it's just it's just bad something i'm curious about uh because i don't know if it's gonna happen for me it's too many i go see it but you know, obviously it's just did it happen for you did, did you get a sense of oh i'm watching kind of a, what feels like a real film it hasn't been it's been a while that's sort of you know like how there's a plasticity to um a lot of mainstream stuff right now, especially Marvel and Disney and stuff, where it's just like it looks yeah. like it's a uh, factory made. Did you get a sense from watching this one where you were like, ooh, my eyes feel like they're being treated? Yes, 100%. I felt like I was on vacation for three hours. And I did see it in 3D. And I will say this like, I do not like 3D. Sometimes it's kind of forced upon us. Um, right. But, and it's not like it's anything better than the first Avatar. It's just that it's utilized differently because there are so many underwater scenes and it's um, it has that immersive feel in 3d. And I, I watch it for three hours and 10 minutes in 3d and it didn't, it didn't bug me. Uh, and I wasn't exactly in the mood to see the movie. I didn't expect to laugh so much uh, inappropriately laughing, frankly, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was, it felt like a real movie. Exactly. Muller. That's hundred percent on the nose on that comment. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's well, something, I'm... right? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're really scrabbling for, like, anything here. Because well, well, like... you, you say, like, it appeals to normies, and I classify myself as peak normie. Like, I always have, always will. I don't pretend to, like, be deep into the comics or any of this kind of stuff. And I, I do understand the people that say, no, you can just turn your brain off and enjoy a movie. As long as there's something that sucks you in. Like, I always judge yeah. things from, um, basically, how much does it entertain me? And if it entertains me, I don't really care if it makes sense. Like, I, I, I'm too busy enjoying what's happening on the screen. I, th I think I'm if sure... it really gets you emotionally, then you can sort of, like... Yeah, all by values. You can, yeah, you can disconnect action. the intellectual part a little bit. Um, yeah. Like, well, like yeah. all, all movies, hot all movies is... have to have... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the hot take here would be, I know a load of people hate the Resident Evil movies. I love the Resident Evil movies. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, I can't yeah, understand how they great. make money. I'm like, I, I'm like, I, I just... It, it's just people killing zombies, and it's it's great action scenes. It may not make sense. It may just be CGI, but it's entertaining, and that's Do you have a favorite how I see it. Out of curiosity, um, two. Really? Yeah. Oh, two. When when watching them over, I think two scored high for us because we did an EFAB arc on it. But um, the, I can't remember what it was. Was it either after? It's four or five where it gets so insane and bizarre. There's like holograms mm. and. Underground oh, base, yeah, like the, the one where they're just all—it's basically all in virtual reality and like, yeah, yeah, they bring it. Fucking, yeah. like, just, like Michelle suddenly... Rodriguez comes back and stuff. I think, yeah, everyone gets resurrected, the and uh, they're like, Leon Kennedy is here now, and you're like, why? It's like, yes, <laughs> okay, because yeah, yeah. it didn't care. It was just like every part of the Resident Evil movies is to set it up for the next action scene, and that's all it was. And so I, if you I go think... in just. I, I think I liked two because it was probably the closest they got to actually emulating the games. It's like they they took elements from Resident Evil two and three and just mashed them together to make this abomination of a film. But it's like it was about as close as you were gonna get. Beyond that, they just completely went off in a a, a random direction. Dude, yeah. I don't know if any of you remember. One of the best parts is when uh, Ian Glenn in the last one, when he meets up with like three different Alice's or whatever, and he he refers to them as the Trinity of bitches. This <laughs> is like wow. <laughs> I like this guy. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's it, it's okay to like just like stupid fun movies because I mean that's why I like schlock. You know I love like crappy B movies from the eighties and stuff like that. They're freaking terrible. You have to have a a certain level of um, you know suspension of disbelief when you're watching any film. That being said, the, you like them because they are what they are. It's not like in Resident Evil, like right in the middle of the action, the camera freezes and the girl looks to the camera and goes, women, get it done. And then the action <laughs> continues. That shit is what we get now. It's not just stupid fun. It's stupid fun with like really horrible ideology attached to it. <laughs> yeah, I think well, a movie only has to be good at what it's intending to be. And moments like that pull you out of it. And it reminds right. you of the real world. And now I don't care about the movie because you're making me think about this or you're making me think about how much I dislike yeah. this or whatever. And that's well, the kind of the problem. Right. So if this movie yeah. is like, it's just an action movie where it's about family and uh, preaches to values that people naturally have, like universal values around the world, mm -hmm. then if it's entertaining rather than intelligent, I think that's fine. 
That's sure. exactly what this is. It's pure escapist entertainment. And it, it just sta- it just stands in contrast to so much we've seen lately. And I thought I I, I was entertained. I was enter- I was entertained for three, and I can't believe I was entertained for three hours. Uh, you know, it, it re- the film rarely slowed down. I mean, what it did, it's sort of like okay. So I, I found I found places for bathroom breaks, which is hard for me because um, I've only got one kidney, so I gotta pee a lot. That's my uh, that's my mutant superpower. Right on. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's exactly. What you said. <laughs> to me, I was just entertained in spite of so many flaws, characters that I thought were terrible and didn't work, or just story points that that was stupid, right? Or uh, or whatnot. And I, I, you know, I, so I was entertained. So I'm curious, really curious to hear your thoughts. And there's so much to pick apart. Oh my god, I can't wait to to talk to you guys or, or just. Yeah. yeah. Talk about the things that just don't work about this film that are just, just god awful. I think the next open bar is going to make for an interesting discussion. Like, like I'd be going into this one with no real emotional attachment and no investment in the world of Pandora or Avatar or whatever. Like, I, I would just go in uh, as someone who wasn't massively impressed by the first film and just take this one at its own merits so i don't know how much it plays on that that attachment to the previous movie it it doesn't like for me like the first avatar i was entertained it's fine and then i didn't really think all that much about it that was it um but and you don't i mean you know it doesn't it is sort of a direct like like uh right after the events they kind of catch you up uh, on the last like decade of, of what's been happening. Uh, and, and I'm, uh, God, I don't know. I actually don't want to say anything. Just, um, really, really curious what you all think. Un- unfortunately, I can't stick around much longer. I gotta, um, take off, but, uh, uh, I, I appreciate drinker having me on and, and oh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate you coming on, man. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back. Uh, I'll be back quoting a James Cameron movie. Um, <laughs> Uh, take care. Uh, love you all. Hail to the chat. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Take care. Later. Subscribe to Film Threat. There's my one plug. There you go. Uh, there we later. go. I'll, I will. I will plug that and say that uh, the link is in the description. So please give Chris a follow because he gives fantastic insights into all aspects of movie making. Appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Later. Bye bye. Thanks, man. Yeah, we need to get him back for uh, like a week or two from now when we do a, the, the next open bar. It's going to be like post Avatar 2, so we can actually yeah, hash this one out, find out if it's shit or not. <laughs> I don't know if I'll see it. It hmm. sounded like it was, but he didn't care. <laughs> That's the way it came across. Right. It was like he was entertained despite the flaws, which I can kind of see. Um, I think that happens sometimes with films. Like if they get you on an emotional level, like sometimes mm. you can overlook some of the logical flaws and it's just like well i had a blast with that and i don't care too much about the rest so i can honest, kind of appreciate it sounds like i'm gonna hate this movie i think <laughs> oh, so no, yeah. no, <laughs> everything he was saying there i was like Mauler's gonna destroy this <laughs> but hey you know it's gonna be like a real movie and i like some of james cameron's work you know it's gonna be great it's gonna be great hey avatar oh what a movie i can't wait to see what happens right. with J- jake jake jack sully there you go I, I I I will eventually watch it, but I just don't know if I can do three hours of Blue Monkeys in a theater. It's that's yeah, just me. three three and a bit <laughs> hours is quite asking a long a time. Asking a lot. Yeah, that's asking quite a lot for me. Oh, geez. Uh, but I, I I was going to ask you as well, like because obviously you know Chris was able to fill us in a little bit on Avatar too, but uh, the thing that I was going to talk about a little bit as well was fucking Willow, like. <laughs> God damn. Like, I'm not even a massive fan of the original movie. Like, it's one of those things that was just kind of on occasionally when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, it's all right. It's got it's got a bit of 1980s charm to it. You know, it's okay. Yeah. Um, but watching it's- this, I was just... I had to grit my teeth to get through that first episode. It was a legit slog. It was painful. Yeah. And, uh- the first 20 minutes. The first 20 minutes is the most densely packed 
amount of sort of messaging and crap I've ever seen in anything. Oh, it was wow, like, we, yeah. Like, we need to get every all of these box. characters introduced. Yeah, exactly. All of these characters introduced, every kind of message, this is who it is, this is what they do, this is the message about them, and it's like, next, 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 all the way through. And it kind of slows down after that, but... Yeah. That, that yeah, first 20 a... minutes is a masterclass of how to... Um, they, they just appeal. want to make it really clear that the two main women in this are gay for each other. Like, yeah. super gay. Like, that's... Yeah, they're... Princess Kit, there is a tempest in her, and it's called Hurricane Dyke. And she is in love with her little sidekick. I don't know what they call her, like a knight or a lady in can, waiting. Can I, or yeah, can I just say that yeah. fucking actress was in Falcon and the Winter Soldier? And is that my, she's from? I, right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's diverse Jesus with ginger hair. But, like, she's got a ginger <laughs> afro, so I don't know. I don't know what she did to offend the gods to end up like that. But, like, <laughs> Must have been something what? bad, but like Somebody this, this in. actress is a bit. fucking plank of wood. She can't act, oh, but yeah. she keeps yeah. getting cast in like major Disney productions. She must be why, the niece of they, one of their executives or something. Why do they call her that though? I must have missed something in the ether. Like, why is it Ginger Jesus, whatever? Like, <laughs> well, I didn't in, watch in... Falcon and Winter Soldier. I, I got oh, like, you half an episode you miss in. That? I, I, I got half an episode in and I couldn't take it. Like there's well, some you, things you've I've got to do more. better, Magog. You've got yeah. to step up. I I made it two episodes into She Hulk. I call that a win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. I inter I interrupted you there, so uh, please let allow your, yourself to continue. Oh no, I was just asking why they called her that. Is it just because she was bad in Winter Soldier Falcon show or So her character was kind of portrayed as like she's the leader of a terrorist group, but they're like ultimately revealed to be like freedom fighter type people who are completely morally right and she's a lovely person and then she she dies in the climactic battle and she gets carried to like I, I guess like a waiting crowd of people by Falcon and it just he looks like an angel carrying her body up to heaven oh, oh okay and it's just it the now. most cringe inducing <laughs> nonsense i think i've ever seen in my life it's awful I, yeah i i watched a lot of the marvel shows but falcon winter soldier is just the one that i couldn't fucking make it through i'm sorry i yeah. i did all of wandavision i watched all of the hawkeye you know so on and so forth uh, the the loki one but that one i just it was so uninteresting i just never went back to it so yeah, I, I, I don't had blame no context you. on this actress, but in Willow, she is essentially an unlikable plank of wood, like you said. But Princess Kit is worse. Yeah, honestly, she's an insufferable, insufferable character. Uh, it, it one thing I've always hated, and maybe some people might disagree with me, is the modern language in a high fantasy setting. Like, yes, I I do that with Magog because I do comedy. Okay, and if this was like a comedy and it wasn't attached to Willow, it wasn't a, a franchise from George Lucas, then maybe I could kind of forgive it as like a CW kind of goofy fantasy comedy show, you know. But this is supposed to be Willow, right? It's supposed to be based on this epic movie from my childhood. And it's, it's I hate when characters in high fantasy, you know, TV shows and stuff go like totally or, you know, things like that. It's really jarring. I, I think it's that combination of... Because for, for a start, this kingdom that they live in, I have no idea what the ethnicity is meant to be there or what the language is meant to be there or the, the accent because you've got a mixture of like theatrical English and like modern day Southern Californian just <laughs> jar, right. like jammed together. Like it's insane. You've got like... Um, you've got white people... Black people, Asian people, Mediterranean people, again, all just jammed together into this weird mishmash, but it's meant to be within a really constrained geographical area, so there's no explanation for how all these people ended up together. And it's, it's just so weird, like, exactly like you say, when you've got the princess who talks like a modern-day 21st century college graduate versus, like, she's she's ranting at people in, in the royal court who are... are right at least trying to put up the pretense of being like in a fantasy story where they they talk in like grandiose english language damn it you know and it, it there's nothing to explain how these two wildly different people are somehow talking to each other 
It's right. bizarre as fuck. You yeah, actually, it's... In, the, in at the end of the first episode, you have someone use the word jog on, which has yeah. to be the most colloquial yeah. slang thing I've ever seen intro introduced into a fantasy series. And the weird thing uh, is about the difference between the parents and the, the kids is that they don't even seem like they're from the same family. No value yeah. or anything has been passed down from generation to generation. And this is a royal family. They're going to inherit your legacy. You make sure that you train them since birth to take over what you have left. And yet you've got one guy who's meant to be sort of the guy she's getting married to who's completely different from the father. And like, how on earth did you not raise your kid better? You just kind of left him in a room somewhere and he just came up with his own ideas. These don't feel as if they're part of this world. It's like you pick them up out of California, like a load of 20 year olds out of California and put them into the world and said, just have at it. It's weird. Well, like Princess Kit is put into this situation where she's appalled at the prospect of an arraigned marriage. And she's mm -hmm. like, no, I shouldn't, I should, I don't want to marry. I want to be like, you know, with my, my gay girlfriend. Um, but like, you've grown up in this environment. You understand exactly what marriages are when you're part of a royal family. They're not, they're not love affairs. They're like political, they're political. unions. Yeah, and it's like you wouldn't you wouldn't have that attitude of like, no, I should have to do this. It's like, of course you fucking do because that's how this works in your world. That's what you've been raised with. Like, and this is this is the writer's mindset getting projected into a character that shouldn't have those attitudes. Right, and and it's even if you don't love the guy and you have to marry him for this political alliance, but still have like a lover on the side. That was very common. People oh, yeah, are mistresses, yeah. people. And so it's really jarring, too, like at that party scene where she's like slow dancing with her girlfriend and the prince she's supposed to marry is like right over there. And she's and doing it like in always, full view of the whole yeah. court, like proper, like, like up, pressed up against each other, like really oh, yeah. like sexually charged. Oh, and like nobody bats an eyelash. <laughs> like, I'm like, sorry, that wouldn't fly. <laughs> Right, I, I'd be okay with the character having like a lover on the side, but shouldn't they be like, like we can't do this in public, you know? Because it's you're at a party to promote your engagement to the prince. Why are you just flaunting this? It's so bizarre. It, it's because the show doesn't come from the point of view of the characters, where it's like these are our opinions in this world. It's from the writer's perspective of this is what's happening, and this is my opinion of it, and whether it's right or wrong. For instance, right. um, she, she's like talking about this one, but you do have characters which are on the other side, which is generally good, where you sort of um, know this is about duty, this is about realm, this is about bigger than you. But it makes very clear that these characters are horrible people. And because they're horrible people, obviously right. their opinions and their interpretations of, and values are wrong as well. So at the end of the episode, she's talking to the person she's supposed to be married and they're like, well, when we get together, we can literally lead a revolution and change all of this stuff. So that's the opinion of the writer. But there's a right. very weird scene after all the dancing scene where she's had a go at, like, for, for some reason, she falls out with the girl and just starts attacking her future husband for no reason whatsoever. But at right. the end of it, the prince smooths it all over. He does exactly what he's supposed to do in that role. He, he, he smooths it all over. He's the diplomat. He plays the royal that he's meant to be. And the brother just attacks him for no reason whatsoever yeah. Yeah. and goes, you're a horrible person. Why don't you just go back to being with as many women as possible? And it doesn't yeah. fit. But it's because just before that, she was telling the girl that you need to do this, this is about duty. And so they linked the two. They made sure that you knew she was a bad person. And so her values and opinions are wrong. It was... Well, the, it, the women like... were talking. The women were talking. And the prince interrupted. That, yeah, that's, that, that's pretty much I... it. It's like, how dare you, like, talk over us? How dare you, like, express an opinion when we're gossiping together? And it's and just it like pick a side between. But again, people. he just he just fucking takes it and flounces off like the absolute pussy that he is. And like, you know, the the girl that he's um, infatuated with, she's like a Muffin serving girl. girl. But yeah, then she Muffin talks girl. to him like she's his equal. And again, like this is yeah. like a, a a peasant talking to a lord or a prince. Yeah. Um, but like she talks to him as if like they're they're just two equals dating each other in again modern day fucking California, and it's so stupid it's so it just takes you out of the the story completely because again it's not the characters talking it's just the writers giving their opinions of how these people should interact with each other yeah and I, so think they're going to use, I think they're going to use her arc to show essentially what people should transfer into because she's the closest that you could get to sort of a feminine traditional woman out the entire show right which is she's not I a fighter 
yeah, yeah she's exactly. not a fighter she's a cook she's she's very she's very proud of her muffins you know yeah it's, exactly she has very kind of more traditional values she wants to get married to him and all this kind of stuff right but she's a as, infatuated as teenager oh I, I don't think i'd go that far but yeah she's she's in love with the prince and she wants to sort of go right. through the sort of the more traditional relationship and stuff um and she's like i don't want to see you with other people we should get married and that kind of thing um but as you go on, that kind of falls back uh, to the point where in the third episode, there's actually a part where a guy says, I think you should do it. I, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of you should do like we're going to do this. And there's only one option to you. You need to submit. So now she's got the villain of the piece telling the traditional woman that she needs to submit to him. I'm like you're getting a bit far here. So I think her arc yeah. is literally going to be transferring from this more traditional woman who cooks and everything into essentially the princess where she's right. a fighter, she's going to stand on her own two thing and everything. Uh, she's powerful, yeah. she's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be her transformation into what you should be. Because she's well, basically the only woman which is even acting that way in the entire show. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there, there is, a, you know, from the movie, she is the baby from the movie. She's a Laura Dannon, right? So she's supposed mm. to be this great savior, right? That's going to unify the world and defeat the darkness. So you expect her to transition to that role. But how they do it, it'll probably be more of a, like a jumping off point for her to become more like powerful and independent. And she'll probably turn down the prince. There might even be like a little love thing between her and the the other prince. The one that's supposed to marry Kit is like this really weak guy. But he has like really great ideas. You could tell he has like knowledge. And every time he says something like really smart, people shut him down. And it's like, why are you shutting him down? He has important information. Yes, yeah, like, I'm hoping so that like bizarre. he's... If if I you know if it was a half decent writer behind this like he's he would eventually emerge as like an actual like legit strong character like he starts out kind of meek and like downtrodden by his father and stuff and like right. pressed into a role he doesn't want but gradually he becomes his own man he becomes like uh, more assertive and he's able to like push his his own like views um, on people a bit better you know because he's actually quite smart underneath it all. Um, yeah. I just I hope the show has at least enough brains to do that, but I just don't believe that it will because he's a man, no. so like he has to be like an asshole ultimately. I think they're gonna do the She Hulk arc with him because there was a scene that was very like She Hulk in this when he approaches her when she's trying to do magic and he's like, oh, I I'm sorry, I I'll, I'll I'll just go away and leave you now. That was the scene in She Hulk where he's like, I'm sorry, I don't know how to talk to you. I I should I should probably yeah, it's be like, doing this. It's like I'm sorry, I'm sorry for existing. Like, yeah. please, I'm sorry for being in your presence. Like, I have to leave <laughs> now. Th there was a bit of tension between them and that kind of scene as well. So I think eventually she'll probably end up with him. But I think he'll remain the meek person and she'll like dominate the two. Really. I, I think yeah, she'll go through the arc into be the dominant person and he'll just kind of stay the same. I, I just like see watching this as well. Like you've basically got three female central characters in this, like the the princess, the 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 knight and the serving girl. And right. they're all like they're all about the same age. It's weird. It's almost like they even like pick them from central cast and it's like well we need a brunette a redhead and a blonde you know just to like <laughs> we can't have two gingers though if we have one ginger we've got to get rid of the other one <laughs> yeah we're gonna have to genocide one of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's so just like it, it's people I, again this is the problem that i have with shows like this and like when you've got a bunch of young actresses together who haven't done much and like who probably haven't like lived particularly interesting lives they've got no no gravitas to them they've got absolutely no screen presence they are just a bunch of pretty looking wall ornaments that are there on screen to say the lines that they're there to say there's nothing to them and this is the problem like this is what the show lacks right yeah there's there's plenty of scenes too where like princess kit who's supposed to be this really kind of masculine figure but they gave it to a woman so she comes in and, you know, the two guys are about to fight. She's like, sheath your swords, boys, you know, and, and she's got like, she stands like this with her legs spread and she's, you know, she wears the pants. But then it turns out she's actually not very good at fighting at all. And all the people she's fought and trained with have been taking it easy on her because she's the princess. They don't want to hurt her. Right. And so she has like this one moment, the show did do this, where she's like, oh, I guess I'm not that great. But then they just wash over it and have these like ridiculous fight scenes and everybody wins and it, 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 it falls flat, 
you know, I kind of like that character arc where somebody who thinks they're all great and they have talent and, you know, and then they learn they're, they still got more to learn. That's a good thing for a character, right? But, Absolutely. Yeah. If you can yeah. actually hammer it home and like have right. real consequences there. Right. Like she faces off with the bad guy and he just defeats her instantly. And that makes her realize like, holy crap, like maybe I don't know as much as I thought. I had too much confidence going into battle, but because Almost she's like mad Luke Skywalker in Empire. Yeah. Right. Gets his hand cut off and shit. You know, it's like that's can be really good. It's poorly executed in this show. I mean, absolutely. That's because Kit is entirely insufferable just as a human being. Like, every right. single scene, the moment anyone else is getting any kind of attention, she has a face like a slapped ass all the time, and she just starts <laughs> complaining about them. It, it's incredible how unlikable they've made her. Because I don't I, think they... She's not meant to be. Whereas, on the right. other hand, I like the mother, I like the queen. It's just then they had to give her a load of stupid ideas and decisions. For instance... You've got a baby who needs to save the world and fight a, a, an evil sorceress in the future to save the entire realm. I'm not going to teach her magic, though. Why? I don't know. There's, there's no reason why I haven't. I just think if she can't, yeah. if she doesn't know magic, everything will go away and we'll find some other way to do it. It's so everyone with good decisions, like even uh, Borman at the start, when he's like, "You do not know what's beyond that thing. You are not prepared. If you do not concentrate on this, you'll all die." And I don't even know why we're going on this. You're a load of unprepared children. That's a great idea. So in, yeah. the, in the next episode, what do they do? They undermine him. Uh, he's yeah. basically a liar and a thief. But even he, yeah. he doesn't have any consequences. He he basically lies to her about her father the entire time, which this, I hated this in episode two. He literally says, you know you are, you wanted to know about your father your entire life. I know all about him. And then he walks off. She doesn't follow yeah. him. She doesn't question him. She's like, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you another time. It'll be fine. I, it's not as if I need to know now or anything. But, <laughs> right. She finds out that he's lied to her, and she's just fine with it. She's like, oh, yeah, I expected this. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm, not, it's, I'm not going to talk to you guys. Because There's Mad no Morgan's a piece of shit. It. Right. It's, here's another one that baffled me the first episode. And, you know, Drinker, you can, you can answer this one for me. Uh, if you were the king of a nation and your son, the prince, was kidnapped by an evil crone and taken to Canada, um, would <laughs> you send the princess and four teenagers to rescue your son I, I probably like, wouldn't. I don't know, the no. army. <laughs> I, I think I would probably send the army, or at least a right. team of highly elite mercenaries or something that, like, yeah, I could some afford to lose. Yeah, like, holy crap! Like, this is the worst decision making I've ever seen from like a monarch in a high fantasy show. She's just like the daughter's like, I'm going to go get my brother, and Sorsha's like, Yeah, go ahead. And well, then this when the, the thing, like now. Steps up, <laughs> This is this is always like for us. I guess this is going to be judged against something like House of the Dragon, where you had right. oh, God. extremely smart, well written characters, and like even you know the the character who wants to uphold tradition and just continuity and stuff, like is actually portrayed as a really decent person who makes like the best decision they can under the circumstances. Right. Um, when you compare it to this, it's just like a, a it's like a child's finger painting in comparison. Like there's nothing to it. <laughs> Not yeah, an ounce of yeah. substance, not an ounce of thought. It's just simple, disposable garbage. What's what's really entire... bad too is is I'm sorry the 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 when the captain of the guard steps up and goes, I'll go, and she's like, No, you're too important. But yeah, the princess, like the, princess the princess isn't. The princess isn't. I don't. Maybe her mom knows she's insufferable and hopes she dies. I wouldn't blame her actually because she's really annoying. Like you, like you were saying earlier, you know, that scene where she's in the the um, the ballroom, like she's talking to her her future husband and um, just acting like a completely insufferable arsehole. You know, like woe is me. I I hate the fact that I'm betrothed to this guy. Um, I don't understand the concept of medieval marriages. Um, I just hate everything, and I'm so fucking pissed off with everybody. I'm just going to take it out on all the people around me, like a petulant child. Uh, it just it absolutely turns you off that character. Well, oh, that yeah. seems and horrific, she... because she wants yeah. her future husband to lob a, sword, a lob a dagger at her brother's face. But the yeah. only <laughs> reason she wants him to do it is because she assumes he'll miss. That's the entire point of that scene, that he can't <laughs> fight, and so he's going to kill her brother. And she's like, yeah, but her brother... You know what's funny? Her brother just stands there and he yeah. would probably let him do it. It's like, why are yeah. you doing this, man? Why don't you just take this thing off your head and be like, fuck you, I'm not taking part in your ridiculous game, I'm out of here. 
It's, but like that would require him to have a bit of agency, and it's like, no, right. can't do that. He has to just can't, do whatever yeah. he's told. Hell the hath entire... no fury like a princess who wants to scissor the help. Okay. Yeah. You don't. The mess entire with theme it. of like the show is almost like Zuma resolu- revolution. It's sort of it this, this mo- uh, monarchical kind of passing down your legacy to the future generation is wrong, and so we need to inherit it and then take over. And you were right. on about the the scene before where. Um, shouldn't we have sent these people? What made it worse is they even include a scene in their own show where Willow tries to kidnap the girl when she's younger and she says, what on earth do you, the queen comes out and catches him, what on earth do you think you're doing? Don't you think I would have sent the entire army after you? You're like, well, no, actually, <laughs> I because you've already shown us yeah. previously that that's not what you would have done. So, <laughs> like, this show even contradicts itself. And it's why I get the feeling, when I was watching Rings of Power behind the scenes, I was like, oh, this explains everything because... You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you, you didn't. You, it's not that you didn't try. It's that you don't think about any of this stuff. This is as good as you're capable of. It's just kind of this is your level. You don't think that deeply about anything, and so you end up with a very shallow show. Right. Willow's the other way. It, everything is so bad and so densely packed bad decisions. But I don't see how you can come up with this without doing it deliberately. Like these are. Yeah. You do wonder. Yeah. I'm starting to think. The guy who wrote for Dawson's Creek might not know what he's doing in the fi- fantasy genre. I'm just throwing <laughs> that one out there. Because <laughs> who is the? He's also the guy who wrote Solo, a Star Wars story. Hmm. It's it's that I can't remember his name, but I have to look it up again. But yeah, well, I'm that's impressed who's to remembered the, Solo. So that's something. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's the guy who wrote for Dawson's Creek and Solo, a Star Wars story. And I think he was hired because he just knows Kathleen Kennedy. Can I just say, it's wonderful it's called Star Wars or Solo Story, so the, so, solo or Star Wars Story, so that people could be like, why is it called that? It's like, because they were going to do loads of them, but it uh, didn't work out. Well, <laughs> well, I wanted to say the whole title so that it, so that people didn't think I was talking about the Mario Van Peebles movie, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, was, was it called Rogue One a Star Wars Story? That was the same thing, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That one, the continuation of that one is Andor. Well, it's a prequel, but at Rest- least... Yeah, and or pretty good. Prequel. Yeah, right. yeah, I still haven't yeah. seen it. I need to. It's it's really really one of the best in the Star Wars shows. It it because it's really grounded and really kind of gritty, and there's no like lightsabers and force. It's more assume, just stories, right? I assume you'd agree but, that being the best of the shows is not a particular achievement. <laughs> it's like right. All right. The, yeah, I think most the, people would say the, Mandalorian season one is like its competition. Maybe I don't know. Right, yeah. the The problem with it is, um, it's still kind of pointless because you know everybody dies. Well, I mean, it still can be fun, and yeah. I really enjoyed Andor. But in the end, they can't they can't take it any further than Rogue One because they did Rogue One first, and everybody dies. So it'll probably get what maybe one, two more seasons, and then maybe have a spin off if other characters become popular. Andor's all planned. I think it's two seasons. And the next right. one, they're going to do like three episodes, then a time jump, and repeat that till the end. Are we allowed to um, say that things that happen at the end of Andor? Because I was going to talk about something I heard, but I don't even know if it's true. But I'm assuming we're all right for spoilers for Andor, right? No one cares? Yeah, spoiler away. So yeah. I, I, I heard the after credits scene, so to speak, or the ending of it was that K2SO is in the show now, at the right of the end. Did they I'm, get Alan Tudyk back? I'm, I don't. I don't know if he speaks. I'm assuming it's a bait, like like they, they get right. the droid, or, or they. I don't know. Someone in chat will know. But I'm curious if um, if that'll be enough to maybe tempt people into watching it as well. Like he was like my favorite thing in Rogue One. So. Well, I mean, I, like I like I said, like I, I did in my review. Um, Andor is not a bad show. Like, and I I find myself like very surprised to be saying that about anything. Disney Star Wars related, but it's not bad. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, pr- the Especially the prison episodes with Andy Serkis. Those were yeah, they're, really they're good. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, that was a really good set of episodes right there. A little good, a, lo- a really good arc. And I really enjoyed just kind of exploring the world under the Empire without all the lightsabers and the Force and all that stuff. Yes. Um, the, the sort of everyday life, like the the everyday right. grind for just like average citizens of the empire, especially like living on these kind of crappy industrial planets and stuff, um, it, it's kind of interesting, and it does that 
that really good thing that Star Wars desperately needed was it actually shows the Empire as being like ruthlessly efficient and intelligent, which they right. really needed because like after the First Order and stuff, like they just seem so hopelessly incompetent. Um, but like here, you get to see them actually making smart decisions. They have to like, yeah, um, they have to like follow up on leads, analyze data, like just do simple like. So I say simple, but like mundane stuff like that to gradually like track down the people they're looking for. Like that's important for like building up your antagonists as um, intelligent people who are a and force to be reckoned with. I like that the, the bad guys, the, the antagonists were just like normal people who actually believe in like order to the chaos. Like, yes. like when that one when that one guy who failed utterly and they fired him and he gets a job at that one place and it's just rows and rows of these like robotic cubicles. And it's like, yeah, that's yeah. the empire. That's the empire where everybody just becomes complacent and falls in line. And that's what I liked to see about Andor. Like Andor was really good in that way. You know, it's, it's, a, world kind of, of, it's a world of people that are always trying to elevate their own position. Like, even yeah. if it's down to the level of, like, a, an Imperial intelligence operative who's been put in charge of, like, setting up an HQ and, you know, he'll say something simple like, oh, can I be made a prefect? Because that, like, gives me a little bit of elevated um, prestige on this right. world. But, uh, you know, I, I don't want any more pay or anything like that. I just want that title. And it's just a very human moment, like because that's the kind of people that you're dealing with here. People who just want that extra bit of power, that little bit of extra prestige, whatever you might call it, um, because it's it's how human beings operate, you know? Yeah. Do you think Andor would have done better if it had less episode? I think so. <sighs> because Maybe, yeah. it falls into that arc, because I know people have said it before, there's like a three for three kind of thing where like the first two episodes are set up and then the third episode is um action uh, it kind of right. it varies a bit towards the end where it's like a, a four episode arc kind of thing but that's the, your, your basic structure those two set up episodes you could probably condense them into one because there's a lot of, there's kind of a lot of like recycling of conversations and ideas and stuff that you don't need to do and it probably could have been cut down to about uh, do you think eight it would episodes have... Do you think it would have a better reputation if it wasn't called Star Wars? Or at least connected Ooh. to it? It would have had a better reputation if it had come out first. If it had yeah. come out before The Mandalorian, I think uh, it would have done so much better. Because if people I, saw I, this and they were like, this is the benchmark for like what Star Wars on TV is going to be, I think it would, uh, it would have been a, a great endorsement of what they could do going forward. But right. coming out after things like Book of Boba Fett and Obi Wan, um, people just didn't give a shit anymore. Like they yeah. had too much, too much garbage fed to them. I often want to remind yeah. everybody, like Boba Fett and Kenobi, that was some, that was some next level garbage, like insane. Yeah. Can't Th believe this is even made. And I, and I can say this, like very truthfully, like this is far and away the best TV show that Lucasfilm have put out so far. Yeah, I mean, I, well. I'm going to do a little hot take here. The book of Boba Fett, obviously, I didn't care for it, but I did like parts of it. I actually liked the parts where he kind of dances with wolves with the sand people. I don't know why. I was just kind of I was kind of drawn to it because it was like, you know, surviving in the desert and uh, kind of seeing the culture of the sand people. Uh, I, I at least found it somewhat interesting, but then it just veers off into like, I want to be a mafia boss and two episodes are just the Mandalorian again, right? Like it's it's like part two of the Mandalorian or something. It it it, it didn't have a good structure to it. Um, but I, I, I know that probably isn't very popular opinion, but I at least like those bits. But the other main than that, thing I remember about it was finding it all so odd that they would like such cruel, like they they, they put such cruel shit to him, but that he like gains this huge amount of respect for them for some reason, and then they're all killed, and he's like, "I'm gonna kill the people who killed them." Kills a bunch of people, finds out later, oh, they weren't even the right people. <laughs> right? He, he, just, he just slaughters a bike biker gang, and I guess we're not supposed to feel bad because they're like a biker gang who murders people in the desert, but. He still just like killed the wrong people for that, you know. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of wrong with Boba Fett, but and I'm not trying to start a 
a fight or anything like that. I just, hey man, I did, I did kind of like that stuff, but I, I kind of like that survivalist stuff. I wish more shows in the Star Wars universe because it must be hard to live on these planets. Did That's you why like, I liked it. I, it's like, like a survival the, mode, you know. Did you like the, the rainbow Vespa? The what? The rainbow Vespas. Did you like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> That you drew the line shit. there, okay? You're like, no. I, I, I drew the line at, at colorful floating mopeds, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think it was on the same time as Wheel of Time, so I never even watched it. But all I saw of the entire show was that guy who does the random spin move to shoot a guy that's in front of him that he's already put <laughs> yeah. his gun up. I'm like, I'm done. I'm like, I don't need to see it. Dude, that's that's enough for me, bro. The absolute so cope. Cool. And Twitter was like, they do that stuff in the OT trilogy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm going to aim at you and then spin through. It's like, what are you doing? Call of Duty montages. Oh, it was so that, that was like straight out of a John Woo movie, but like a really <laughs> shit version of it. It's like I if you tried to film it yourself in your living room or something, just with like a, a knife <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the scene would have been better if they had released some slow motion doves in front of him. Oh. Yes, yeah, 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 for sure. That that would have John wooed it right up. <laughs> but uh. yeah, I I I felt like the bikes were really like they're just as jarring as in the prequels when like Obi Wan goes to meet that big you know CGI alien at like a 1950s diner. Wow, you pick it on you know? Dexter. <laughs> I, I don't legend, hate the scene. Right? I'm I'm just saying it's kind of <laughs> jarring, right? Like I, all of a sudden I, he's I, in like this 1950s diner, but it is Coruscant, so maybe that's okay because it's a big city, right? I I hate you know what I hate is when like these these man, this Vespa gang was built up as like this terrifying like um, group of like marauders who like cybernetically enhance their body and they've got absolutely no regard for human life they've been raping and kill pillaging and plundering their way across tatooine and then you right. meet them and they're the most like soft looking like fucking <laughs> calvin Klein model yeah. group of like assholes you could ever expect and like there's just nothing to them they look like a stiff breeze would blow them over they know what like, you get I when Someone says, like, we have cybernetic marauders at home. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like you wanted the Borg, right? And you got these, like, millennial assholes. I, I, like, I, I wanted, know. yeah, I wanted Mad Max or something. Like, right, what I yeah. got was just, God. Like, like, that is a cool idea in the Star Wars universe, because Luke even has a robot hand. You know, that's not outside the realm of something happening in Star Wars, is people modifying their bodies. Yeah. But... They do it in such a way that it's like more of a fashion statement. These look like Calvin Klein models, right? Yeah, and it's not cool. intimidating at all. If you had a gang that had augments that like depend on their kill counts, like they have to earn it, and they're all like upgrades and enhancements. Yeah. Not like I what did one of them had like a, a jackhammer foot that he tried to use on a car. It was one of the <laughs> bizarre fucking things. Like, what am I looking that's at? That's a that's a really specific augmentation. <laughs> 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 What the like? Besides the car, what were you going to use that thing for? Like in a day-to-day -day situation? You never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like Dennis, maybe it helps take one upgrade for a specific part of the story that you know that's coming. I don't, I've never understood. understood this idea of like augmenting your body with like, yeah, you know, I'm going to chop my arm off. I'm going to replace it with a robotic one, which requires like like regular maintenance. It needs a battery pack to power it. Like just all kinds of things that can go wrong. But it's like, you know what will never really go wrong? My actual fucking real arm <laughs> that I can just control myself. <laughs> like, right. know, like, like, like take Deus Ex as an example. They're like stronger, you can have grenade launches in them and stuff. Yeah, like so stuff I, like I that, okay, like fine, going. but like Yeah, like or it would if... take it would take a lot for me to like agree to have my arm just removed and replaced by a fucking big hunk of metal, you know? No, well, I'd I like, think take, that... take your legs. If your legs can make you run faster and jump higher, then they're better than your legs. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take an MOT every year just so I can you run know, faster and jump higher and stuff. You know what I want from my legs? I want tiny little wings attached to my ankles that will allow me to fly up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, give me some Hermes boots now. I want some robotic Hermes boots. I thought you were just going to say you want tiny legs to just run around on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just I've always, that too. My, 
tiny <laughs> legs with tiny wings. <laughs> tiny, tiny. I've always wanted my dick to drag the ground. Now I, now I can. Yeah. When you take, when you take off, you just flip upside down straight away. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody put well, him on upside down. You can take the down. Supergirl angle, where she like flies into a mountain in the first episode. I was like, oh, the cape is for aerodynamics. That's how she turns. <laughs> oh, like, oh, yeah. What? Do you know anything yeah, like, about physics at all? No, it just works, right? The, the cape helps yeah. them turn. Okay. They just, they got to make shit up. Like, could you imagine like if they were, they had to flap as fast as like a hummingbird swings. So you don't really see them. You know, it's like uh, just a vibration of you just like through the fucking air. That'd be yeah. fucking hilarious. Made in China. Yeah, and now I know <laughs> I am. Um, I was, <laughs> I was going to move on to this next, but um, I know I covered this in a video just today, so I won't labour the point too much. But uh, yeah, we've we've had these articles come out recently about how um, Marvel are very unhappy about how Phase Four performed, and so they're they're looking to retool uh, Phases Five and Six with the lessons that they've learned from Phase Four. And what I just thought. Why did it take you two years to realize this shit? Like, you must have known from the moment that Black Widow hit the cinemas and it absolutely flopped that, like, oh, we we made some bad choices here. I think you it know? comes yeah. down to how a corporation works. So, like, say you're the person that actually greenlit that project and then worked on that project, produced it, signed it off, and everything else. You're not going to want to admit that that was a mistake. And so a corporation is like a giant, massive ship that the only time it'll ever turn is when so many people in the entire place realize that they can overcome whoever was the person making the decision. And if that person's high up, it takes even longer to turn. And I thought you said I a giant massive shit there. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, that'd work well. as well. It's still going to be so difficult you... to turn in water. Um, <laughs> they're both float, so it doesn't really make a yeah. difference. I've always had a problem turning giant turds, man. <laughs> well, <exactly. Yeah. laughs> that's the whole point. It's like a lot of these companies... They don't just hire one person that makes a decision. They hire a load of people who all believe the same stuff. And so the, you're going to have a lot of people thinking, yeah, you know, we lost money, but it's not our money. It's the corporation's money. And it, we, right. we we told people what they needed to know. And so until you actually get to a point where we have lost so much money that nothing matters more than the money, and you're like, okay, we need to fire some people now because that's when it needs to change. And I, I think that's yeah. the point where you've, got, you've gone through an entire phase and like, we can't keep this up. Otherwise, we won't be a company anymore. Yeah, right. It's, I mean, it's, I, I it's, think they they need an Elon Musk to come into Disney and just like absolutely lay waste to everything in his path. Did, did you it. hear what he did just... recently? It was like um, I, I I I heard it on Twitter. I didn't fact check it, but they said that um, what was it? The janitors went on strike outside the building, so he just fired them. It was like, I'll, yeah. I'll <laughs> like that's the kind of thing you need to do. You made a bad movie. Well, you're not going to do another one. But a lot of the Disney right. stuff, it's like you made a bad movie, it, it didn't make much money or didn't make the money it should have done, which I think is one of the issues. They try and, if you're an analytical company or you know about statistics and stuff, you can make something seem like more of a, a, a greater success than it was, um, spin it a certain way. And so sure. they get promoted to the next movie rather than people going, well, you made that one, that was ass, and so you're not going to make any more. So they make a few before people go, okay, you've done it several times in a row. This, we can't keep this on. Yeah. It, well, it's what happens, too, when you make movies via, like, a board of directors instead of, like, a creative person going to a production company and going, I have this really great idea, right? I have this really great script here. Please fund my project. Now it's more like this board of director, directors go, we have this IP, we have this project, hire a director, hire a writer, hire, you know, like, it's all made up top and it filters down until you get shit. And it's all about who you know. Like, I don't believe Ryan Johnson got Star Wars because he was a brilliant filmmaker. He had two movies, Brick and Looper. That was it. That was all his movies. And they gave him Star Wars probably because he rubbed elbows with all the people like Kathleen Kennedy. And, you know, he rubbed elbows with all the right people and he got the job. And I think that happens way too much in this kind of corporate movie making. Well, I think with, uh, you know, with something like this, um, their problem is almost like like it's not just the boardroom that's making the decisions. It's so spread out now. Like there's so much that they're trying to do all at the same time that there's no centralized decision making because there's too much to try and get your head around. Right. You know, with this, um, I think with phases one to three of the MCU, they released twenty three movies, which is you know it's a good number. You know, that's about yeah. two per year, rough on average. 
Uh, with sure. this one phase, in the space of two years, they released 15 different projects. So 15 different movies and TV shows um, right. in the space of two years. It's just overwhelming. No studio can maintain that kind of like content output and actually may be able to quality control it. It's too much. Yeah, it's massive. It's a huge machine. Uh, but what do you guys think the like wrench in the machine is gonna gonna be? Is it gonna be this kind of drop off of viewers, or is it gonna be the ideology stuff? I think it's it's the the drop off of movie viewers for sure. You know, the first three movies like massively underperformed, partly because we were still kind of in lockdowns and stuff when they came out, but partly because they were just fucking crap. Um, but then you. The, the the real dependable ones, like the heavy hitters that they would have expected to get a great return on, like um, Thor, Love and Thunder, like right. Ragnarok was was really successful. They were expecting the same from that, didn't really get it. Um, Black Panther, you know, the sequel to that, like the movie that was like the, the greatest film ever made in human history, apparently. Um right. You know, it's, you, you, it's struggling to even get to 800 million. I'd, I'd be surprised if it even reaches that at this point. You gotta know they are sweating about the marbles now. Be like, oh god, yeah. That's oh. why they haven't released a trailer. <laughs> that that when that trailer finally comes out, that is going to get fucking annihilated. And all Dude. the comments will be about how they're morbid time and stuff and shit like that. And yep, <laughs> I can't oh. wait for the scene with. Aragorn, blah, 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 you know, all that sort of shit. Because, yeah, that's the way that it seems now comment sections air their grievances. They're just fucking memed. They're just memeing all over the place. Yep. So, I, I love do it. you think that it was the pace of content that was Bob? Because Bob Chapek was like, well, we've got all of these channels that we need to release actual stuff in. And it's like, but we haven't been able to do it because with, you know, lockdowns and everything, we, we couldn't actually make things. And so only now, I think he said this a quarter, is when we're getting to a point where we're releasing things across all channels at a pace that we actually want. Because especially with you know, Disney Plus, you've got the churn, and I, so I think it's going to well, increase if anything. I, I think um, there was less restrictions on like releasing things onto Disney Plus. In fact, if anything, there was more incentive to do that because okay, yeah, filming's maybe going to be a little bit more problematic, but um, you know everyone was locked up at home and they weren't able to go to the cinemas. So Disney Plus was the the place to put stuff, uh, and so yeah, it made sense to like produce as many Marvel. TV products as you possibly could to fill that void and get this streaming service off the ground, um, while also I guess trying to maintain that 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 schedule of uh, of movie releases. Um, so yeah, I, I can see why they they were under pressure to do it, but like there's no way you can maintain that many projects simultaneously. I mean, this is why you got things like She Hulk with the like absolutely terrible like early two thousand CGI because the 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 see like whatever special effects houses they use are split between like a dozen different projects simultaneously. Yeah, and they're they're working like slaves. I mean, all the all the reporting out of that part of the industry is like these they can't get in they can't hire enough CGI artists to you know like these people are working hellish hours. Right. I, I spoke. I I spoke offline to a person who works for like a major VFX house. Um, they were based in Canada, but they do loads of work for Marvel, and they said like. Um, we 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 have a room set aside for people to go in and basically have an emotional breakdown in for like half an hour or so, like a crying room we call it, and then come back and go back to work again. Like that's how bad it is. Just a soundproof room to go in and scream. <laughs> just <go> scream yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. Like people were going in there just losing their fucking minds for like half an hour or so, and then like back to work it goes. You know, that's the thing is, if there's one thing I care least about in. A, a movie or a TV series, the CGI. It's like, you you know what's fake and what isn't. I, I play right. computer games of varying different graphics all the time. Maybe it's just me, but I, I'm never really going to pick that up as a critique if the rest of the movie is good. Whereas yeah. you compare that to the quality of the director or the script writers, which I, is where like I care most about a movie and where I think most of the quality is made. It, yeah. I, like, to, to think that the CGI artist is... Okay, they're overworked and stuff, but they're not really the reason that it's failing. I think that's no. an excuse that it's just, it's like, just a, well, it's just a symptom off. of a larger problem, really. And the the larger mm. problem is um, not having enough time and not having enough people um, devoted to each project. And so oh, you can, you can see that. PS2. Well, you can see that lack of quality control 
in every aspect of it, whether it's the CGI or whether it's just the writing or whether it's the acting, the direction, whatever it is, it's all just like, we've got to get it out as quickly as possible because we've got deadlines to meet. We've got the next project that has to come along. And, um, you know, you lose all aspects of your, of your, your quality control then. And it starts with the writing, but it ends with the, the VFX and everything else in between. Right. Yeah. Well, VFX is supposed to prop up your story. I mean, there are plenty of older movies that have early VFX that kind of looks like crap, but I still really enjoy the movie because now it's an excuse. You know, you get filmmakers who are like, oh, we'll just CGI that. It's like, no, back in the day, you had to figure that shit out. You had to build something, you know, you had, to, you had to make it work. Right. That, yeah. the, that is the crappiest CGI of anything I've ever seen, but its story <laughs> carries it. So yeah. nobody, nobody right. cares about the CGI. And you actually find it's a bit like VR. Um, your brain just accepts it after a while. You'll you, the first time you see it, you're like this is awful. But because yeah. you're drawn into it and you're like immersed in the game, but your brain just goes, okay, this is my reality now. I don't care. Right. You form the neural pathways and you've just accepted it, right? But and don't get me wrong, I'm not a hater of good CGI, but people in in that are making films now are relying almost too much on it. Mm. You know. And to where now everything is like sterile, everything's in front of a green screen, everything, you know, like, because it's expensive now. We've kind of flipped. VFX used to be expensive. Now, traditional effects are really expensive because you have to have artists, you have to have people build puppets, you have to have people build these massive costumes and rubber monsters and stuff. And that stuff's really like handcrafted, you know, that that's really more expensive than just somebody doing it on a computer. Now, oh, hundred percent. Like doing, like, uh, say you want to, you blow up a set for like a, a pyrotechnic scene or whatever, like an action scene. Um, to to do that practically, it's way more expensive and difficult than it is to just do it with CGI. Because yeah. with CGI, you can run it as many times as you want. Like, you know, practical effects, you've got to reset every single time, do the whole thing all over again. Yeah, so, yeah I, like I, that's that. Yeah. That's that, that what reminds me. Of. It's, the conclusion you end up with is essentially the whole we'll fix it in post attitude, which leads to laziness. We don't need to do right. it now. It doesn't need to be perfect now. We just need to film it and get it out, and someone else will cover our mess. And so they right. pass it on to someone else as, like, it's their fault. That's the excuse. It's not really our fault. And that's the thing you actually see throughout the TV shows. Like, no one has accountability. No one has responsibility. It's because that's what their life is. It's like, oh, we could just pass it on to someone else. Someone else's excuse. We're, we're part of a greater whole. And right. I, I think that when you get down to it, and these TV shows used to have like values that the people would pass down, everyone sort of agreed on the same thing. They were like universal values that everyone would share. It all affects each other. And once one thing starts to crumble, it has a knock-on effect down the line. And so once you get lazy and you think it's not really my fault, I'm, it, it's the world's fault, everyone else can take responsibility, it affects your work. Nobody, there used to be, um, people would take pride in what they created. And it doesn't feel like they're doing that anymore. Like, do you, do you think that Taika Waititi is proud of Thor? Or do you think it was just another movie that he did? He got it's paid just, for, yeah. and now he's on to the next project. Yeah, yeah, it's another paycheck. Right. And, you know, I mean, he made money. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, like, hate on somebody for, you know, capitalism or whatever. You know, yeah. like, you can make... When it comes to money, know, well, I, I, I don't think you can take how much money a movie makes as the deal. It's how much movie the next one makes. Because you've right. damaged the brand. And it, I don't it's think gonna the next be a... Thor movie is going to be anywhere near this one. It's chipping away at it slowly. Like every bad movie is going to damage because we're all in, we're in like franchise, um, the age of franchises now, right? You know, I, I can remember being younger in the 90s and stuff. There were no franchises. You get sequels, but usually in horror films, right? Like cheap, cheap sequels, straight to DVD, you know, stuff like that. But now we're in like franchise modes. Everything has to be a franchise. Like we have to be able to take this as far as we can take it. I think as well, there's an element of, particularly within Marvel and Disney, of like, well, you were successful before, so we're just going to do the exact same thing again, and you'll you'll make us another billion dollars, right? That's the deal. Right. So, you know, you had Taika Waititi, he did like Thor Ragnarok, okay, like like that reinvigorated the Thor franchise, good stuff, all that, all that nice stuff. Uh, so yeah, Taika, just work your magic again. Just do the same thing again. And like, all he can really come up with is like, well, I'll just uh, do more humor, I guess. Um, yeah. You know, that he was the thing that made it, the right? movie. Like, you was could that? tell. You just didn't want to make it. Like, no, exactly. Like, this was just low effort. Like, fuck it. Like, I'll collect my paycheck. Just make a lazy ass movie. Shoot whatever comes into my head. And like, we'll just fix it in post, as you said before. I, it, 
It was the uh, interviews of that movie that got me, though. Because he was talking about um, he was unrestricted. He had the sense of humor of a six-year-old, which, having seen the movie, I don't think anyone can disagree with. But, like, why would anyone think that that was going to be successful? And one of the things that got me in that movie is they started talking about, we had a lot of fun filming it. It's like, I don't care. I don't think yeah. you had fun filming your movie. I can't wait to see it. I hate movie. when, yeah, I hate when people but, throw shit like this in. It's like, oh, we had fun making it, or yeah. do, you know, a lot of people worked hard on this. It's like, well, I don't care. It's still like what you produced was shit. It doesn't matter yeah. how hard you worked. You go, you go back what to the watching. Audience, it's like though. if you make a video, you say, well, I went twenty four hours on this, and none of you like it. Yeah, that's your fault that you spent twenty four hours making something that nobody likes. But yeah, it, you but... saw it in lots of other stuff. She Hulk was like, well, we had a great time making it. I was like, and seeing the backstage stuff, I'm sure you did. Still I, came out I with would... crap though. It doesn't really help. <laughs> I would go see a movie if the director sits down and it's all like, I had a fucking heart attack making this film. I was in the ER. I was so stressed, <laughs> you know, like that happened to George Lucas. He thought he was d dying. Making well, the I'm first sure, Star Wars. like, I'm, was, sure, like I'm sure, Franc I'm, I'm sure Francis Ford Coppola would look back on Apocalypse Now and say, I fucking hated making that movie. It was oh, like yeah. the worst experience of my life. Yeah. But it was like, yeah. well, uh, you know, you produced something really good at the end of it. So like, right. yeah, your, your level of fun in making this thing doesn't really interest us. What interests us is like what you actually made. Ultimately, yeah, what, you know, yeah. when they do have fun, though, right? Like Lord of the Rings, people cherish the behind the scenes of that. I don't know if you guys saw the uh, get together they had to, like, I guess the reuniting thing they did for one of the COVID specials or whatever, but like the amount of chemistry that that crowd of people have because of how much fun they had when making it. So it's just kind of cool. And you kind of want it to be that way, but at the same time, hey, if it costs you blood, sweat, and tears and we get something great, then. That's fine. Well, I, I think with the, with the, with Lord of the Rings trilogy, though, there was probably a lot of like difficulties and oh like, yeah. yeah, hard hard times that they went through. But like because oh, they had yeah. a good camaraderie together, like they they forged a bond between them. You know, so, they even got like, tattoos, didn't they? They all got like tattoos yeah. of the fellowship. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because it was were, it, it was a good time, but there was also a hard time. I remember Peter Jackson was like, I nearly died. Like, seriously, like, he lost all this weight. He was hospitalized a couple of times. Just the stress and the schedule and the, the massive, you know, undertaking that those movies were. But, but well, I still look back there. at it, and I don't know how it happened, to be honest with you. We got lucky with that one. I'm, I, I want to say as well, I fucking love all the <laughs> Jer Jennifer Lawrence memes that are coming out. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Jennifer Lawrence I mean, was the Big Bang, okay? <laughs> just, Jennifer Lawrence just... is a poor. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't paying attention, and then I just said, saw Jennifer Lawrence's disparu. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I hadn't seen it. The there you go. Movie. Can somebody just do a collection of those memes and then put Whitney Houston's I'm Every Woman to the, <laughs> <laughs> to the slideshow? <laughs> I'm trying to get the best of them here. <laughs> <laughs> But this this used to be a value that everyone kind of shared, that to produce something good or to do something good, it was going to be challenging and difficult. And so the suffering that you did to make something good was worth it because of the end product. Whereas now it's like, and it's even in the entertainment. It was like, no, I don't like this. It's like, I shouldn't marry this guy, even though it's good for the realm, because right. I don't want to. And so it's all about me and what my wants and my yeah. happiness. And there's no kind yeah. of sac sacrificial nature to it. And you, that... They're writing that because that's their lives. Well, you know, I, I don't want to actually work on this movie. This movie should be fun. And it becomes more about the people making the movie and how much fun they're having making it than the end result and the thing they're actually well, trying I, to sell. You know, you know what's interesting? I think a lot of it is built on this mistaken belief that uh, the strength of a character lies in their ability to stand up for themselves rather than what's right. And so, right. you know, compare that to... They don't to... agree with you on what's right, though. That's the problem. Well, I know, but for their point of view, like what's right is just like whatever's whatever I want personally yes. for me, like whatever satisfies my needs and my my sort of desire narcissistically for for self fulfillment. That's what's right, and that's what I need to fight for. Um, but then, I, like I said before, you compare that to something like uh, House of the Dragon, where you have characters that are very much uh, aware of the world that they live in. And they have to make difficult compromises that might result in sacrificing their own personal happiness for the good of the the wider world that they're part of, because it's their duty is what's expected of them. It's the responsibility yeah. that comes with privilege, and that's an important thing. And it speaks a, like volumes about a character that they are willing to sacrifice their personal happiness for the good of others. 
Um, but that's not seen as a, an admirable trait in something like, well, Willow, uh, <laughs> where it's just about, no, it's about me. I want to do what I yeah. want to do and fuck everyone else. If, if, and this the, is... the, the... Yeah, on you go. Well, there, there's, um, there's also a big argument about the source material and all that, right? Like high fantasy is losing right now. The House of Dragons really good, but uh, Rings of Power, Wheel of Time, and now Willow. I mean, big losers, right? And Willow had books. A lot of people don't realize it, but they were written by George Lucas and um, I think his name's Christopher Everhart. And they were, they were called the Shadow War Trilogy, right? And I don't think the makers of the Willow show read the books. And I'm not saying that's a prerequisite. I'm not sure they watched the movie. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not entirely sure they watched the movie either. But I'm not saying that's a prerequisite, you know. But it is like when you have source material, why make this? Why make Willow what we're seeing now when you have these books written by George Lucas that you can go to and go, eh, this will make it a little easier, right? I mean, there's literally a scene in Willow. It's the first episode where... Um, the cook catches them. Like she's like, oh, there's, a, there's someone sneaking up on us. It's like, well, you must have seen it. Couldn't you tell that it was like a, a little girl on her own, just like walking up to you? Yeah. I don't know why you all hiding from her. But then she, um, there's a big, there's an exchange between like her and the princess, and she's like, have you ever done anything? Have you ever fought anyone that's trying to kill you and save your life? And she's like, no. Have you? And everyone's like, yeah. Have you? Because Ooh. you've just been sparring. Like. Yeah, she was. Three minutes ago, she fought with evil sorceress, one of which had, like, a chain whip kind of thing, that were trying to kill her. And they'd right. all forgotten about it. They couldn't even remember yeah. what happened in their own show. It's like, oh, no, yeah. actually, I've, I've <laughs> no one ever tried to kill me. Three minutes ago, in the last scene, you were in a massive fight, and you couldn't even remember. So, it's not that they don't have quality. It's not that they have bad quality control. It's like they don't have anyone. They, they, yeah. they film it, they think it's great, and that's it. And yep. all of these people, they need somebody who has ultimate control to go this is awful what are you doing and it's like everyone yeah. is so scared to tell each other what you're producing is crap because of their names or whatever else the power they have in hollywood it it's become so th controlled that nobody is daring to go anything other than yes because <laughs> i don't see how you can watch willow and go this is amazing it's yeah how it, it's talk. abuse this is abuse of uh, franchises yeah. I'm 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 only going to continue watching Willow because I want to know will Princess Kit eventually use one of the four arrows that she brought on her journey. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the entire second and third episode, I don't remember seeing the quiver because I've been trying to pay yeah. attention. She hasn't used an arrow so far. Just for real, was it was it you posted arrow. on Twitter? It's like, well, I hope I, yes, I hope yeah, only yeah, have yeah. to take on four enemies with this. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing, there's even a scene in it where it's like, well. They, they'd they ridden across, like, the barrier, which is essentially a place which makes everything inside it perfectly safe. And she only had right. four hours. So, okay, maybe... And like, we'll resupply at the outpost. They hit the outpost. It's already been destroyed. We can't and get any like... more arrows. So I've just got four <laughs> arrows to go off into the deadly area outside. It was like... But it was like she doesn't even wear a quiver. Too. Yeah, Out, like, outside she, she does she's not wear a quiver horse. the entire time. Yeah, yeah, it's so... It, like, and when they get to that barrier, the one place you can cross is the gate and mm -hmm. they have four houses out there. I'm sorry, if there's only one way into your entire realm, I'm building like a fortress. I'm putting 10,000 yeah, like, men there. I'll, I'll just right? put my army there. That's, the, that's yeah. it. Like it's like, a magic The towns inside that have walls and fortifications. <laughs> yeah. The gate doesn't. Well, it's, it's <laughs> like Shang-Chi, whereas like there's only one way into the magical bullshit alternate dimension. It's like, it's never guarded. <laughs> So just put yeah. a bunch of armies there. Just, like, guard it with everything you've got. It's just worse some... than that, though, because their, their town has just got attacked by four evil sorcerers. Where did they think they came from? I've, your first thought would be, well, they must have broken through the gates. <laughs> That's like yeah. the only way into this place. Seems logical. <laughs> Send an army to the to the mother gate, because that's the only way in. Jesus. That's... It, it, it's... It's not just bad writing, it's childish writing. It's like somebody's writing the script with crayon, you know? I actually think that's a good... Yeah, I, the, the first movie was kind of a children's movie. It was a family movie, but it was aimed at kids. And I think that's <laughs> the excuse they use for the... Ah, six-year-olds is not going to understand this. They're not going to yeah. pay attention. It's fine. Sure. Right, it's like right. This, Yeah, this is... This is... Yeah, this is a different time that we're in now. Um, I just when love I... this one. Jennifer Lawrence is the size of a tangerine. <laughs> <laughs> 
watch one watch the world burn. I imagine it's not gonna be long before she has some posts about like how like oh the internet has attacked me for my Yeah, yeah. Opinion. That's a good narrative. Uh, these yeah, boohoo, Jennifer. Know. Cry all the way to the fucking bank. I'm sure you'll be fine on this one. <laughs> yeah. she, she dabbed the tears with $100 bills. They insult yeah. my performance in passengers. How could they? How, how could they watch Mother and not love me? <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, I expect actors to have a bit of an ego, right? Like, you kind of have to to be in that business, right? You, 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 you're in front of the camera. People love you. There's millions of people singing your praise. So when they see a negative comment, they're like, how could this be? You know, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. there are a few humble actors, and most people always love them. Like, the, the humble actors, Keanu Reeves, right? Like, he just bowed he's down. Just Did really... you see at Comic-Con? He literally bowed down to yeah. the audience, head on the floor. Like, right. I, I don't even care if that's performative art and he doesn't really believe it. The other actors in Hollywood would not even do that. It'd be like, I'm not going to humiliate even, myself like that, would yeah. you? Yeah. Wouldn't you even plebs, I'm not going to bow down to you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, anyway, yeah, Willow's a huge disappointment for me because when I was a kid, now, when it first came out, I was too young. I was born in 85, so it came out in, like, 88. I was, like, three. But I did eventually watch it when I was, like, seven or eight in the early 90s. My mom had it on tape. You guys remember those? Anyway, um, yeah. I I fell in love I with remember. it. I, I fell in love with it, but it did also terrify me. Even though it was made for, it's a high fantasy genre, but like Ron Howard wanted to like bring a budget and a scale to high fantasy when he made Willow. It just didn't perform well. It, it garnered like a cult status after the fact, like a lot of home rentals, home movie, you know, uh, that's where it made up its, its losses. But I remember watching it when that troll gets turned into a, like a, gooey booger that starts growing heads and willow like kicks it off the bridge and it turns into this massive dragon i was i had nightmares i was like seven like I, that i've always well, harbored this strange suspicion that people were mildly disturbed by warwick davis <laughs> <being the lead. laughs> hey i'm more disturbed by him in the series i i watched the movie just before the series to like remind myself of it I can't right. remember him being this bad of an actor in the original movie, but in this, he's the worst actor out of the entire lot of That's really Oh, Jesus. It, it's That's literally, oh. you are the person that we need to save. You are the last hope for humanity. We must go across the shattered shore. And like, well, let's make this for yeah. a sec. Maybe he'll grow into the part. No, she, every she single can't... line is delivered the same way. He can't be worse than, like, Ginger Afro Girl. There's nobody, oh, like, is. there's literally nobody acting today who's worse than her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, you're you're right, but he also has years of experience. He should be better, right? Like yeah. she's like young and stupid, and you know, she hired because she met you know meets check marks or whatever. But he he's been doing stuff. I mean, it's not just Willow. I mean, he was in what Star Wars. He was one of the Ewoks. He he had his own comedy show where he played himself. I can't remember. I think it was called like Little Big World or something like that. Um, he's been performing all his life. He should be better. And I think it's the writing. I think the directors have a part in that and the writers too, because I mean, God. his character is kind of horrible. It's like, this isn't does Willow a TV that I show remember. Over here. He does a TV show over here that he presents. He delivers every line in that exactly the same way. I didn't really? know what it was. I'd have to Google it to find out what it was. Um, right. But that's up to like six seasons. And his kind of comic bit in that is that I tell bad jokes. That's, that's right. the point. Right. He's like the heel of the entire show. And it, it feels like he's just playing that part again but in willow which is no, weird I, when he came out and said no i was inspired by star wars it's like no I actually think you're more like the tv series than anything else right yeah i i i want to finish with this because i know we're going pretty long and you probably want to bring it to an end here soon but bad humor in willow it's this modern i blame marvel because marvel kind of started it where people just kind of describe what's happening in a sarcastic way and that's supposed to be humor yeah and i hate it i fucking hate it like there's a moment yeah. in the in in the I latest episode where the, where they're like, oh, we have to go to the voluptuous canyon or whatever. And they split up. And and the Princess Kit's like, well, whatever, we'll, we'll meet at the Valley of Boobs. And then I'm like, that's in the show. That's a real line. She said, we'll meet at the Valley of Boobs. I don't know how to laugh at that. Do I laugh because it's not funny? Is it so bad that it's funny? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's terrible. And I hate I this know. new humor. It's that, yeah, it's the... The Marvel kind of like self-referential humor, right. where it's like taking the piss out of its own 
fantasy tropes and stuff but it's like well you're then making it impossible for me to buy into what's happening because it's like i'm seeing this through the eyes of someone who's openly mocking the very things that they're trying to show me on screen i I, I don't know what i'm supposed to do with that it's like okay is this just a comedy am i just supposed to laugh at every aspect of it i don't know yeah they they do it in the beginning of the third episode where there's this epic flashback and Borman's telling the story of this ancient kingdom and Kit just interrupts him and it's like no wonder they call you Borman and I was like did they name him Borman for that joke probably probably but that story <laughs> has been the best thing about the entire TV series it was like yeah, and I then he put on this Borman. armor and he went out to fight two thousand people I'm like okay what happened then. And then they interrupt it and stop it. I'm like, I want to find out how one guy fought 2,000 people. Come on, that that's interesting. Yeah, but, uh, I want to see that. I want to see that story. Where's that? Uh, maybe they ran out of budget. I don't know the budget of Willow. I, I honestly don't. As much as I love the original <laughs> film, when I found out it was coming out, I knew Disney probably wasn't putting their full weight behind it. I, I don't think the budget is all that high for this one. It doesn't look like it, that's for sure. Right. Yeah, uh, it, it's 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 pretty kind of CW, and I know a lot of people say that like for almost anything coming out these. Oh, it looks like a CW show, but that doesn't make it untrue. <laughs> like no, it costume, absolutely doesn't. Like they yeah. are they are stretched thin these days, and uh, I can't imagine they would have allocated a huge amount of budget to this because they probably didn't expect it was going to be a big success. And they're right, right. because it doesn't and deserve right. to be. Yeah, there's um, there, and they don't even know what f- genre they're doing. There's a moment when Laura Dannon is in the spooky woods and she comes into this, you know, there's like two woods women and they're dressed like cowgirls. Like they have like cowboy hats and denim on. It's like overalls. And it's like you just crossed over, like you, you escaped medieval world and went into Westworld, right? That's what, that's what happened. Just it's, it's the most jarring editing. Like she's in a spooky forest. All of a sudden, there's like a beam of sunlight and a house and two women. It, it's a pointless scene, but it's also completely out of character for a high fantasy film. Why are they dressed in denim overalls? What, what is whole, going on here? That whole scene was like they'd heard about what you should do in a movie and then written it into their thing. So they, they heard the point, but didn't understand why. And so they heard about foreshadowing. I thought, oh, well, we're going <laughs> to foreshadow the hell out of this. And so for the entire scene, she's going, no, you'll die. If you stay here, you'll die. If you fight that guy, you'll die. You're definitely going to die if you stay here. And then the guy turns up and she's like, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to fight you. And like, well, she's going to die then, isn't she? And then obviously fights him and immediately gets battered in the first hit. Like, I never saw that coming. That's a surprise. <laughs> These people understand. It's like they've been through a university lecture of how to make a TV series and then didn't understand any of it. They just know the checkboxes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is it AI that generated the script? I'm I'm, I'm genuinely curious. <laughs> like I, I thought it feels like that. Honestly, when it's yeah. when it's not been given any context for fantasy settings, it's just like oh, I'll just generate you a generic script based on this criteria. Right. Yeah. It's it it. I thought the scene was like really oddly shot. That I thought that these weren't going to be real people because they were like. I don't know, magical apparitions to distract the girl so she can, you know, like, or maybe some evil witch in the woods that's trying to tempt people into her house like Hansel and Gretel. That's what yeah. I thought was happening. No, it turned out two lesbians in the woods and they get murdered. Oh. Well, I, I was actually expecting a bit more backlash against that as well. It's like you just introduced this new couple and immediately killed they them off in the same the lesbian. <laughs> yeah. fridge Always them. fridging them. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, anyway, just... On what was mentioned, uh, I think the only one who didn't say anything for it was, uh, well, I say this as if it was a plan, it's not, but Disbrew, what would you describe as Marvel humor, out of curiosity? Uh, Marvel humor to me is Taika Waititi's level. So, as they say, like, six-year-old, very basic, very obvious. Like, I'm very picky. I I was raised on British humor, sort of like coupling, black books, black adder. Yeah, Um, I love black books. And like the IT crowd, and that's yeah. kind of what I like. And so when it comes to yeah. American humor, they don't really do that. Everything's a bit more obvious. It's a bit more in your face. And <laughs> like, that's what Taika Waititi is. It's like the sense of humor I might have had, you know, 30 years ago. Well, because what I find really interesting is um, 
Like so, so with Ragnarok coming out, right? A lot of people said it had Marvel humor, and I said, "Oh, uh, what do you mean by that?" And I got like criticized for that. Like, how could you say that? You're the guy who like goes after Marvel. So I was like, "Okay, so I start collecting these because I'm, I'm super curious. These are the answers I've gotten for what is Marvel humor. It undercuts drama. That's Marvel humor. It always undercuts drama. It's like, oh, okay. Another yeah. answer. It's always in spite of the urgency of the situation. It'll never be tonally appropriate. It's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Another one. It's always putting characters out of character. They'll just make jokes no matter who they are. It doesn't matter. Okay, and I was like, uh, sure. Then there was jokes that get spammed. And I was like, right. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah, it's kind of like so, a machine gun. It can be, yeah. Well, Hang on, I'm halfway through mean? the list. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I, I, like, He's got I, I a can list. reply on each of these ones. Like, I'm still on the foot. Like, <laughs> I, I, I can. I can... <laughs> jokes that is all they Hold do on, is I'm writing this down. Uh, dis well, as you brought up, describing reality. I was like, yeah, I, I think I could see that too. There's like jokes that denigrate history or source material. That's another one that people right. find common with Marvel. Jokes that are just not funny. <laughs> I was just like, well, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty big contention. That's just a statement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, and as you said, like jokes that are just really childish. I, but the thing is, like, yeah. I don't necessarily disagree with any of these. The only problem is, like, at this point, Marvel humor just means, yeah, it's just shitty comedy. Well, yeah, because yeah, the, the first two were essentially like relieving tension, which is why edgy joke, because I, I really like the sort of investigations into why humor is funny in the first place. Jimmy yeah. Carr does some great stuff on this where he investigates like actually what makes things funny. But a lot of it comes from um, the, the reason why edgy stuff is, is funny. It's like from dark humor. It's like gallows humor kind of thing. So yeah. the relieving tension actually allows people to cope. So right. if you're just, it's not, yep. it's not designed to undercut the seriousness of the moment. It's designed to cope with the moment. And so right. the, you, you need two things. And if Marvel is never taking itself seriously, like Thor, no one took that movie seriously. And so if you're not serious to begin with, if there's not actually something dramatic and important happening, you can't undercut it. And yeah. th the joke isn't meant to take away from the seriousness of the moment. It's designed to make you not break down in tears at it. That's the whole right. point. And I don't think unless you actually take it seriously to begin with, you're ever going to nail that kind of mark. It requires an so, intelligence that I don't think someone like Taika Waititi can even do. So so which is one on the list? This is a perfect example. There's a moment in Willow season three or episode three where he's about to jump down a well and he's like, be careful of the were rats. And he jumps down and there's like a poof of dust. And most normal filmmakers would cut to just Princess Kit and just kind of have her like, what? Like, you know what like I was order, thinking during you know? that scene? How did he not break his legs? That's, that's, that's <laughs> right. the only thing. Like, he jumped down a well. Why is his legs yeah. not broken? And then she's I like, you I... need to come up now. It's like, well, you're a tiny little girl. You're not going to lift this big, massive right. guy up. And but... then th there's a load of weir rats that are looking to attack them. And then you can see them. And she's like, what, yeah. are we supposed to wish? They just show them running out. It's like, well, did she pull him up? And they just watched her? You know, the, the people yeah, it just cuts and he's up. Yeah, oh. he, it just it just cuts and he's up there. She, they don't show her yeah. like pulling him up. But when he jumps down, goes, be careful the were rats and jumps down and it focuses on her. That's where right. I would have cut it because that's kind of funny. But were then she rat? has to go, what are rare rats? And from down in the well, he's like, they're exactly what they sound like. And it's like, uh. what is this? What it's is just this? Like la sound like yeah, like they... laboring of joke that's not funny to begin with. Right. What do just they like sound like? Filling though? up space. Like, rabid rats? I don't even know what we rats are. <laughs> Angry rat or rat people? I'm assuming they're not rat people. <laughs> I, I mean, the way it looked, uh, Resident Evil Village, the baby downstairs, it looked like that, to be honest. Oh. It was like a two-headed, yeah, it was like a two-headed little monster rat, right? Didn't look um, like a rat at all. It was like balls no. and stuff. It was weird. No. How, no. how, is, how is stuff like this commissioned? How does a group of people who are used to making TV shows look at this and think, yep, this is what we're going to roll with. People are going to love it. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, that's a question I've been asking for the past, like, decade. I mean, it well, genuinely it, it, boggles the mind, because I have to assume that a lot of the people involved in this are used to making TV shows. Like, they are industry veterans, and they know what works and what doesn't, and they still allowed this to take place. I mean, if you look how? at Rings of Power, they've actually described how they would... Because that, that, they even say... On paper, a lot of other people that pitched were far more qualified to make this than we were. Like, well, okay, they should have got the job. Like, they're clearly yeah. the best people for the job. I was, like, th that's the end of the talk, but it's like, no, we pitched them something that they essentially wanted to hear. And that's what it seems like. They yeah. come in with a In vision. Elvish. In Elvish. See, he... Was it J.D. Payne and Robert... Um, 
whatever his McKay. name is. Patrick. McKay. Thank you. Patrick McKay. Yeah. Um, they impressed the board of directors by showing up to the meeting, the pitch meeting, and speaking Elvish, proving that they were huge fans of Tolkien. I mean, I could look up a YouTube video and come back in five <laughs> minutes if they want. And, and, I like, plus, I like yeah. Bruce is like, that doesn't prove they're fans. No, <laughs> no Bruce literally. I mean, you know, that, that, but, but the thing is, test. but the thing is, speaking in Elvish, like, what does that accomplish? It's like, you could be saying, like, I like to wipe my arse with Brillo pads. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but, like, that doesn't demonstrate storytelling skill or, like, an actual yeah. understanding of the world or anything. That's just and, like, and yeah, you, I did a bit of, like, pointless <laughs> research to impress and you. Know, you. You know the old the whole board of directors in that room didn't speak Elvish, so you could have been making shit up. It might yeah. not have even been. been they, well, you know what did? You know what did yeah. prove that they can't tell a story? Their history, all the projects that they'd worked on, where they didn't even get credited. They'd been in Hollywood for yeah. ten years. They didn't even have credits. This is yeah. they used to hire people off the best people for the job. And one of those yeah. things, one of the things that allow you to actually know whether someone is good is from their previous work. And they ignored right. all of those people for somebody who, it's like, it's like Willow. Oh, I made a, so a solo, a Star Wars story. Well, as Jeremy likes to say, solo lost money. So that should really disqualify you from other stuff. It's like, no, this is the guy no, we, we need to give Willow. everything to. <laughs> like, this so is California and he definitely knows about like medieval <laughs> European fantasy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and just because you wrote for Dawson's Creek and a sci-fi movie solo doesn't mean you, you understand the high fantasy genre and why people like it. High fantasy, like sci-fi is where you go to like challenge societal norms, dystopian sci-fi, you know, all the stuff that they like to push. That's actually a really good genre to challenge if it's done properly. Uh, high fantasy, people like it because it is traditional. It's based on fairy mm. tales and myths mm. and legends. It's Hercules. It's these classic archetypes. Hero's journey, you know, the, the big evil and the big good, you know, good versus evil. People like high fantasy because it's traditional. People like sci-fi because it's a little bit more futuristic and challenges different, you know, concepts and stuff. Now, that's not saying you can't challenge modern concepts in high fantasy if you do, if you do it right. But typically, the people like D and D and Skyrim and you know high fantasy video games and stuff is because they want adventure. It's escapism, pure, simple escapism. Well, yeah. the reason why these values had, like existed for this long, the reason why they're recognizable and has been passed down through time, because they spoke to so many people. They didn't just; these were the <laughs> best ideas that came from literally thousands of years. And so yeah. obviously they're going to speak to people at a base level. Whereas if you take Rings of Power, that didn't care about that. It actually tried to make the orcs the good guys. Oh, they're not evil. Despite the fact that Tolkien is meant to just be good versus evil. In fact, it was criticized as good versus evil. No, the orcs are the good guys because really they just want to make a home for themselves. And the fact that they dared even say that in the making of kind of blew my mind. Like, we yeah. want yeah. to take modern values. Everything isn't black and white. There's no obvious good guy or anything. No, everything's a grey mush. Because Everything's subjective. Everything, everything yeah. comes down to your point of view. There's no inherent morality to anything. It's like, yeah, fuck off. Yes, there absolutely mm -hmm. is. Yeah. There's some universal things we can agree are right and wrong. Um, it's because yeah. if you destroy the objective truth of it, if you destroy what appeals to people, and you're like, well, actually, just get them to make an exception. Once you get them to accept an exception, then you can do anything. Because you've already proven there's a line, now we're just discussing where the line is. Yeah, and that's exactly. the whole point of that. Yeah. So I have a question for the panel, just real quick. What are the odds that enough of these kinds of franchises fail that eventually somebody at these massive companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix finally come out and go, Forget that ever happened. We're starting over. Like, well, I think it's already happening at DC. Um, they brought in James Gunn. Um, he's he's been putting out tweets just today, this very day, in fact, basically saying, "Look, there's going to be some hard decisions going forward about what we do um, in terms of like which characters we keep, which which movies we keep as part of our continuity." But we need to do this because it's important to like produce like a, a half decent product at the end of it. Basically saying, like, you fucked up big time and we've got to unfuck it somehow and it's going to be difficult. Um, so, yeah, I think they get to that point where they run out of money and they have literally no other choice but to, like, wipe the slate clean and start over. You know, I hope they DC do that with Tolkien. Well, DC reached that point because they didn't have as much money to begin with. I think Marvel's eventually going to reach that point because they are, you know, each movie is making less money than the one before it. And right. uh, Lucasfilm, well, 
I, I think Indiana Jones 5 is going to be a massive fucking flop. Ooh. What? Uh, so, yeah. Say it, it, it isn't so. It gets to everyone eventually, but like eventually, no matter how big you are, no matter how much resources you have, eventually that will run out if you keep producing flop after flop. Right. Your, your resources are not infinite. And so, so what like, constitutes like, Disney, a flop, though? though? Disney makes their money off real world stuff. It's it's all of the um, Disney World kind theme of parks. areas. Yeah, the theme parks, right. sorry. Obviously. Theme parks, the words, carnival, the, you know, cruise liners, you know, UK they have the theme biggest... parks, not that big of a I know, but yeah, you can't Disney... have your movie division just consistently losing money and just keep keep it going. Like, you yeah, would have you to need change money something. Man. You need a money man to come in that actually cares about the bottom line. Yeah. And I think they've hired a lot of people that think, it's not my money. You know, there, there's a lot of people who work for companies who don't really care about the profit margin. They're not really business people. And so their ideas take precedence and you need someone in charge to come in and go this this can't handle anymore which i so, kind of think chapek was yeah i think uh, that's that's exactly what he was but he never got a chance weak. to actually make his changes that he needed but iger's back he now right yes. iger's yeah. back now and so it's just going to go back to i mean i i don't have faith <laughs> in, no 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 in, like iger coming back know. is not a good thing as no. far as i understand it um but it, it, how what constitutes a flop, though? These even bad movies are still making hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, how bad does it have to get finally? Like, well, uh, Hollywood accounting is uh, is not what you think it is. You know, like <laughs> we're we're <clears throat> we're at the point now with movies where they have to make eight nine hundred million just to break even, right? To make back all the marketing, all the the production costs. You know right. that that's. You might think you see these crazy box office numbers like getting close to a billion dollars, and you think that wow, they must be making insane amounts of money for the studio. No, they're not. Like they right, they, they have to reach so a crazy yeah, they have to reach a really high number just to just to make back the the cost of them. And so, yeah, like a lot of them probably are losing money for the studios at least in their theatrical run, and even the ones that do break even. You know, if I invest four or five hundred million dollars of my own cash i don't want to just barely make a little bit of profit at the end of it i want a lot of money back right. for that amount of right. risk and what so the solo the most expensive film ever made isn't it like i'm pretty no. I could have sworn well it, avatar it, it, 2 apparently is now oh avatar 2 <laughs> might have taken over yeah but um the budget for uh, Solo was insane because of the reshoots, right? They got like an extra oh. huge. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think, um, I think Justice League was the most expensive. I think that was on the three hundred million mark. Because uh, um, again, because Whedon was brought in to do all those reshoots. Right. Yeah. Because we had the Snyder cut. Yeah. I still haven't seen the Snyder cut. I've seen all the others, but I, I still haven't gotten around to watching it. Yeah, it was two seven five million for Solo. And then it's already just like insane, isn't it? Um, I remember seeing all the behind the scenes stuff. It's like they really did work to put money into that thing. They, I think they really wanted it to work out. It didn't, though. <laughs> Do you yeah. think that they're suffering like one of the issues that the gaming industry has gone through? Because everything's so expensive, they're just like, we need wide market appeal. We need as many people as possible. And so if you want to appeal to the widest market possible, you end up with just gray, boring mush. No one's daring to take risks anymore. No one's going to try anything new. You just end well, up you're with not repetitive gonna. things with no soul. When, when you've got a quarter of a million, sorry, a quarter of a billion dollars invested in a movie, you're not going to want to risk that. You know, the, the, like taking risks is something that you do with like a, a little 10, 20, 30 million dollar film that you can write yeah. off easily enough. Like right. that's fine, you can be bold with that. But like when you're doing these big tentpole movies, they they can't fail. You can't afford them to fail, and so you have to play it safe. That's why they're so bland. That's why they're so corporatized. That's why they feel like they're designed by committee, and they're so dumb generally. Well, I'm expecting this result, but I've just had a little look around the internet. Apparently, it's Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides with a budget of three seven eight point five million. Oof. Damn. I don't know what the hell possessed them <laughs> to think that that would return the kind of money they would be hoping for with that. Holy shit. And I thought, I thought back in the day, wasn't John Carter of, you know, it's based on the John Carter of Mars. It was called John Carter. It was a Disney film and it cost a fortune. 
and it didn't make anything. It didn't. It didn't. Disney actually lost well, big on that one. I kind of. I like think that, that actually <laughs> influenced their decision to buy Lucasfilm and and do Star Wars because they were like John Carter of Mars was supposed to be their big foray into sci-fi, and that was going right. to launch like a massive franchise. It flopped, and they they thought, yeah. okay, but I like us it. doing our I'm own go- thing didn't work. What can we do? Uh, we'll just buy someone else's idea. <clears throat> Currently yeah, number I, nine, I'm, John Carter, by the way. Yeah, even even though it flopped, I'm one of those guys who liked it. <laughs> I don't know why. I just it's just a goofy, fun action I, film I sci-fi. I don't know. I, 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 I don't even know what I've heard about it to be honest with you. Well, I think it's based on some really old, like was it uh, like short stories and stuff? You know, from back in the like 30s mm-hmm. or something, right? Like it was. I can't remember who wrote them. I'll have to look it up, but it was during the time of like, you know, um, those little pulp magazines. Yeah, yeah. you know, like um, kind so of the Conan very, the Barbarians kind of style, right? Exactly. So it was like it's a very old fr- like property, right? And it's just about a guy who, you know, goes to Mars and meets a princess, and it's called. It, I think the first story was literally called "The Princess of Mars," and she's just this hot red skinned chick with wearing a bikini it's like this really it's 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 from those days when it's like space was like a place they didn't know much about space right they didn't know you couldn't they knew on hot Mars, ladies were out there yeah but they knew they knew big you know three-breasted alien women were out there somewhere damn it <laughs> yeah it's, uh, that's straight out of total recall you make me wish i had three hands <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, I was just thinking there as well. Actually, um, we've got a few super chats that have come in. Obviously, as we've been doing this, if you got a little bit of time, we could maybe do a few. Sure. Yeah, sure. All right. So the first one is a three-parter. So it's from Chuxenhausen who says, "Drinker, as much as I want you to do a happy hour on Cobra Kai season five with Jeremy from Greeks and Gamers plus Dark Hour, I have a more important question." Rambo uh, with Matthew Marsden. You had a great interview with him, plus I watched the movie again, and wow, it holds up. Sure, the dialogue is quick, but Sly makes each word count. Plus, Julie Benz shows how to be a strong female character through femininity, which is amazing to watch. That is all indeed true. Um, Yeah, it was good fun to introduce, uh, sorry, to interview Matthew Marsden, and I think Rambo 4 still holds up as a pretty fucking good action movie. Um, It's the one after it I didn't like. Yeah, I think a lot of people are like that, actually. Yeah. Um, didn't like Last Blood. I thought it was a bit right. weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Rambo 4, yeah, I really like that one. Um, yeah. Kevin O'Neill says, Drinker, I'm here to re- reissue my open bar challenge. One shot for every $20 or more super chat. <laughs> well, that'd be a dangerous <laughs> one. <laughs> also, oh, can't believe you've never seen Johnny Dangerously. Hands down, my favorite Michael Keaton movie. That being said, drink. Well, I will, in fact. There we go. Mm. Uh, RRTNZ says, Hail Drinker, as well as the usual Banshee, justified in Black Sails recommendations. I'd add that Stallone's Tulsa King. He dominates every scene and it's his best anti hero performance ever. Have one on yeah, me. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, Thank you very it's much. It's pretty man. good. Uh, yeah, I, Tulsa I, I, King. I, yeah, I've been watching Tulsa King. It's fun. It's uh, it's definitely got that feel of The Sopranos too. You know, he's like a capo of a mafia, New York mafia gang, you know, family and stuff. It's it's good fun. Sounds good. Yeah, the trailers made it look pretty decent, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, RRTNZ also said, uh, just a thought. How about happy hour on some older good MCU films, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume One or the Captain America trilogy? Back when good characters mattered. Cheers. It would be nice actually to do that for a little bit of perspective, I suppose. You know, talking about a couple of decent Marvel movies yeah. from the good old days, like Electra. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> See, that came out like my name comes from Alias. So you had Jennifer Garner in that movie, and like I, I really liked Alias. I know I could probably watch it now and rip it apart, but at the time I was a teenager. Right, that, that's the way it is. I've um, seen Alias. Wait, what's, what's Disparu from then? In Alias, I don't remember. Section S S D six, Section Disparu six. Oh, that's what that's. Wow. Called. Yeah, it means wow. the section that doesn't exist. Well, that's it's a, a loose reference. translation, but yeah, Disparu basically means invisible or disappeared in French. Neat. There we go. Nice. We've got that little bit of lore filled in there. Yeah. 
Uh, Unhinged says, I've missed your scent. Now just to get Az to do happy hour about Hot Rod and my life would come full circle. Well, I think we definitely need to do that. Um, Slack Attack says, do studios and actors truly believe that people will buy into their copium with such uh, dismal box office numbers? Also, how much can they make from streaming? That is a good question and probably not all that much, but... Uh, Right. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, yeah, you can't hide your box office numbers when it's a theatrical release. And uh, if it keeps failing, what can you do? You ha you can't you can't pretend that it's successful when it isn't. I think uh, The Rock's trying to pretend currently that Black Adam is a successful movie. Yeah. Um, good luck to you, Dwayne. I feel Best bad for him, kind of. I don't know why. <laughs> it's just like, oh. <laughs> it's just trying so fucking hard. <laughs> uh, Whalen Becepha says careful Icarus those wings are heat sensitive well what can we do um, Cameron Teague says appreciate all the great videos thank you very much my friend I enjoy making them uh, Kelvin Thompson says hi drinker filmmaker and screenwriter here would love to hear your who influenced your writing process most and compare notes I loved uh, John Truby myself um, my writing process for scripts for YouTube or for my novels um, yeah, in terms of the, like my writing of books, that's just me. Like there wasn't really anyone I based myself off. Um, and as for like YouTube, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I guess you just figure out the thing that works for you. Like it's a bit of an experimentation process. I suppose if you go back to any of our channels from the very earliest days, we're trying different things, maybe seeing what works, what suits us. And you, you find the thing that, that, uh, appeals to you. So, yeah, it's 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 a process of finding things out, I guess. Um, Pyro Ronpa says, "Huzzah! First open bar that I've been to live. Well, I hope it's not your last. So thanks." Uh, Casey Boyd says, "Mauler, why don't you like the boys?" Oh God, where do I begin? Uh, I like season <laughs> one. Season two was a nightmare. Season three was like. It was moments of me being like, okay. And then I was like, no, it's still shit by the time you hit the end. Um, I, from what I understand, most people didn't like how season three ended. Yeah. So. Uh, the thing that gets me with the boys is that people are like, oh, no, it, it doesn't have any kind of woke stuff in it. It's not political in any way. I'm like, well, okay. So you give an example, like when they're walking through the fair, like, see, it hit at both sides. And like, no, it doesn't. The, like, the, the whole fair scene was about corporations using this ideology for their own benefit wasn't having a go right. at the ideas. It was about them being abused by the corporations and for profit. I just and don't understand the whole, like, girls get it done thing. Where people are like, isn't that great? Mm -hmm. It's making fun of, like, Marvel and stuff. And it's just like, no, it's not. It literally does it. It has all the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. What? That, well, that's because it's, not, it's so. not taking the piss out of it. It's preaching it. That's, yeah, it, but he's the bad The interviews guy, of the director right? are wild. Yeah. Like when Homelander's like, girls, get it on. And they're like, it's get it done. He's like, ah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's, the thing. that's probably the most relatable part. It's like, oh, he's the bad guy, though. <laughs> but he's the bad guy, right? Um, uh, Outcrass Creative says, uh, greetings, guys. Uh, the writing in the Boilo was absolutely dire. Extremely poor setup. Terrible dialogue. Drinker, your present is on its way. Ho, ho, ho. It's not a machine gun. Well, okay. I can't wait Damn. to see this one then. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a script for a TV show that he's working on, but uh, yeah, I'll look forward to seeing it. Uh, yum Yum Eat'em Up says, Make ship for Longman and uh, Goo Boy arrived today. Yay! Sweet. I've been getting lots of pictures sent in from Twitter and such. I'm glad they're arriving. They look cute. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's when I see pictures of like the Critical Drinker or the Mauler plushies on top of Christmas trees. It's like, nah, it just warms <laughs> my heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish um, I could do plushies one day. You'll get it. You'll get it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> especially if you with the 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 wizard character that you've got going on. Like yeah, yeah. that's like prime real estate for a plushie. Um, yum. Sorry, hypnotype says uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, would you think of doing any um, tier list streams for movies? I always find them good for conversation and comparison. Cheers. So, yeah, I guess ranking all of the, I don't know, all the MCU characters or all of the oh, Star right, Wars right. movies or whatever. Hmm. Is that That'd be interesting. Yeah. Well, you've done stuff like that with Wolf, haven't you? 
way back we in the day. We did one for Game of Thrones back in the day, I think. And it was such a like slapdash thing. I don't remember why we did it. We were just like, fuck it, whatever. And I think people end up liking it a lot just because they cause conversations and then little fights mm. about like what's right. better out of this and this and whatever your brain goes to first. It can be interesting to think of like that's what you're l- latching onto. I think uh, tiering the Marvel movies could be fun, yeah. See how it turns yeah. out. Phase four, of course, humans no point. <laughs> like it's just yeah. all in the F section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't I don't care much of it. Um Big Dave K says, Hey Critical Drinker, I visited your country in December twenty seventeen. The weather was surprisingly not too bad. I would love to visit again. Well, good stuff, man. I hope you do come back. But yeah, December can be hit and miss in Scotland actually. Like Depends on what part of it you go to, but if you're in the the central part, it's not often that cold. It's not like crazy like northern Canada kind of winters or anything. You know, it's just just a bit rainy. Um, also, don't forget, I won't, man. I know you've got me. Um, you got me some dialogue that I need to record, so I will send that to you. Um, but if yeah, if I... anyone wants an example of British humor, I, I, I find it hilarious that you just the best that you could describe the United Kingdom's weather. Was it's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. like, that's the kind of hour you. That's the it's, that's it, it, it's yeah, thoroughly I mean, it's thoroughly unremarkable. I think that's <laughs> really the thing. It, the word it's never like comes to mind. Oh. Yeah. I was depressed when I I lived there for almost almost six years when I was stationed at RAF Mildenhall, and it's just always so misty and gray all the time. Yeah, yeah. that's basically now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like my favorite weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my personality. Ah, you feel it's right at like, home. What is the weather today? Nothing, really. It's just neutral. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not like, excited yet. It's loading. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just feel like every time I opened my door, I was going to get attacked by a werewolf out on the moors. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it's my favorite difference between like America and the UK. America's like, yeah, America, go freedom. And we're like, ah, it's not too bad. <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah. the fucking best, most complimentary. I might go outside today, perhaps. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think the best I could liken it was like, if you, you know, if you ask an American, like, how are you doing today? Well, how, like, how's your day going? It's like, oh, fantastic. I'm doing great. You know, and it <laughs> makes me think like, yeah, like, that's great. I, I wish I was having a great day as well. I'm going to try and do better. And then you speak to a Scottish guy, like, how are you doing? And it's like, ah, I'm doing away, son. Like, literally, I'm just counting down the minutes until I can die. <laughs> <laughs> like... But that's not what we're thinking. See, I, ha- I have the whole southern hospitality thing being from Arkansas. And it's like, oh, I'm doing great. Have a nice day. But in my mind, I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> the weird thing here, like if you if you walk down the road at nine a.m. and you say hello to someone, they will look as if you, at you as if you just walked out of a spaceship. It's like I, I don't know who oh, yeah. who are you. You're weird. But there's a time in the morning when people walk their dogs where you can say hello to anyone and everyone's friendly and it, sw- yeah, it switches. Yeah. I have no idea why that is. It's just a <laughs> get out yeah. of the city. I don't know. Move to Texas. Gorgeous, <laughs> well, nice to you. <laughs> neighbors walk up and give you food when you move in. It was Whoa. weird. You, you have a lot more countryside than we do. It's yeah. like, yeah. Uh, I, I I live on twelve and a half acres in the middle of nowhere. My nearest that neighbor is fantastic. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm Ideal. curious. Uh, Ideal. Although you may have heard us talking about it, Garrity, I would rather ask you anyway. How would you describe what it is to have Marvel humor? Marvel humor at this point, yeah. If, if, if someone says it in a bad way, like, oh, that's got Marvel humor, what comes to your mind? Oh, well, horrible jokes that get run into the ground, like that are constant, but it's also used to move away from any type of actual emotional scene. So it's so it's like really manufactured and used to it's algorithm written humor to mm. keep you from getting too disturbed if you're watching a marvel product because they don't want you sad they want you happy all the time it's part of the brand it, it's really bad i mean that like you know when in she hulk at the end when they had the kevin ai that could have been funny that could have been funny you could have been really making fun yeah. of what marvel was and and they're so bad that when they had like the lowest hanging fruit in the world they still couldn't seal the deal right so. right it's the ultimate safe humor isn't it like safe is probably the best word to to describe it because it's like it designed to be as inoffensive as possible just really basic really simplistic Uh, i'm not gonna like rile up any any 
protected groups or anything. Just yeah, nice it's like and, nice and corporatized. It's like weed and speak because like weed and speak, you know, rightly so gets a lot of criticism. It's only good when it's written by Joss Whedon, mostly <laughs> in the '90s and late to yeah. early 2000s. And everybody's been trying to copy it ever since, and it's terrible. Yeah. And like James Gunn, Guardians humor was funny, like damn funny in the first movie. The Jackson Pollock joke is the best joke in the history of yeah, the MCU, yeah. period. Yeah. I laughed my <laughs> ass off when I heard that. But like, if they, you know, Jackson Pollock is, uh, yeah, yes, if you do, and but that's the part of humor, it's supposed to be kind You're of right. you know, smart, and sometimes it'll go over people's head and they figure it out. Like, that's you know, I watched Monty Python when I was a little kid. I didn't catch half oh, yeah. of what was going on, two thirds of what was going on. <laughs> right. uh, but I also got a better vocabulary from it. I learned about philosophers. Had no idea. Like they didn't. They don't teach about. They, they don't teach us about philosophers in in school here in in America. They don't. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you know, you 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 learn certain things. Like you know the the philo the philosophers playing soccer. That that's right. some funny shit right there. Well, but uh, yeah, yeah they yeah. copy James Gunn humor. That's all. Same way. It's like you mentioning James you know. Gunn. I don't know if you guys saw it, but at least it was on the Twitter. The, the Twitter twatters for me. Uh, the hashtag fire James Gunn is trending. Yeah. Because <laughs> oh, uh, I lost Gary. Oh, no, Gary. He, he heard that <laughs> and he was like, nah, fuck it, I'm out. <laughs> I gotta go make a video. I, um. Yeah, like the, when I when I referenced it in James Gunn's stream earlier, like, uh, sorry, his, his Twitter thread, and like <laughs> the, the amount of, the amount of re replies the to him were just like, James! Please just finish the Snyder vision. Like finish the Snyder first, <laughs> then you can do your reboot. We'll we'll support anything you want to do, but we have to get closure on this. And I thought, fucking hell, are you still clinging to the Snyder verse yeah, after all these yeah. years? You know for a fact that he and the other guy, they've already planned out like a huge new set of stories. They drop oh, in every Christ, yeah. before. And so now James Gunn's got the challenge of how do I deliver this information to these people without getting them to want to kill me? Um, yeah, you that's can't help ridiculous. but feel a little bit bad for him for that. But yeah, that's the thing. Everyone's just like, you better not be like annihilating Snyder's like startup to the story. It's like, of course they are. Of course they're moving yeah. away from it. I, I just, I, I don't, I think it'd be dumb to get rid of Cavill. I think that'd be like, absolutely. Really yeah, they need to keep it started, especially yeah. when you just locked it down. And I don't think they're going to. Maybe, maybe Gal Gadot, maybe, maybe Godot will be gone. But, uh, She'll get one more Wonder Woman, I would imagine, yeah, and then she'll more. be done. Well, yeah, I mean that got canned, though, right? The, the, well, what's, what's happening with Patty? What's going Patty on? Jenkins Patty's out, I think. Yeah. Do you do you guys think this is actually the repercussions of Wonder Woman eighty four? Yes, yes, because yeah, it was I garbage. Well, yeah, I because I remember when we found out like that she was getting a third one and that she was getting that rogue thing. I was like, Are you serious? It's like after that, and then it's like not anymore. It's like hmm. If it if it came down to me choosing to watch that movie again and getting a spinal tap, I would choose spinal tap. Yeah, I, I think um, yeah, like she could, she could probably direct it, but she can't be allowed anywhere near the script. Like it has to be someone competent that writes it. I think yeah, I think James Gunn. It's just like a coach coming in on a sports ball team. He just wants his people around him. You you don't know, get rid of all the players, right? But you get rid of. The coaching staff. rebuild the team yeah and, rebuild the yeah. team yeah and they are gonna bring in i think uh, zaslov is is well i mean i i know a lot of people i i want to give him credit too but cnn is still going dc comics is still dc comics those are all under warner brothers maybe he hasn't gotten around to them yet but like those still suck but it does look like they are interested in making money at this point which uh they they need to be because they're billions billions in debt uh, yep. and there's <laughs> A good chance they might not ever get out of it and end up getting sold, and maybe that's why Zaslav is there. You know, uh, everybody talks about Netflix getting sold or Disney, I did, Warner Brothers, but they're on the right track because they're actually making decisions that Hollywood should have made years ago. Like we're we're so deep into like, uh, you know, God, we got ex especially this year has been like the cope year for Hollywood. It's been great, right? I'm <laughs> just about to, I was just about to record a video. I got the link. Nobody says no to the drinker. Okay. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just because you appeared in chat. I was like, I'll, fill, I'll put the link to you, and if you want to come in, whatever, it's up to you. I, well, my my video process to fuck around for about three hours, and then actually get around to doing it. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I do for every. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was watching you guys. Uh, 
<laughs> but like with The Witcher, right? With uh, with Lauren Hisrich Smith going, please watch our show, even though we shat, you know, we mocked the source material and Henry Cavill. Right. I mean, it's beautiful. The the cope from them. The, uh, yeah. These people. It's great. Yeah. These people. Those people in Hollywood. Wow, Razor. Yeah, I've got I've got no sympathy for them. They can oh. they can get fucked as far as I'm concerned. You reap what you sow and they they <laughs> have absolutely it, you carry on and in season two of She Hulk they might even directly reference you. Okay, so you be careful, buddy. They'll be I on mean, the they, refer- they apparently I am praying for a second shave as a She Hulk. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm their biggest cheerleader at the moment. Yeah. I even considered buying the her, like hot toy that came out like please, just anything to get the second one out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, Witcher is a dead show walking like that. That yeah. that's done. Nobody gives a shit about it. Like they burned the fans. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. And Henry doing that right before this prequel comes out. Uh, that's not an accident. It's just not. And uh, you know that might have been a fuck you on the way out the door, or like. You would have think they would have at least tried to work this thing out until afterwards. Uh, not that anybody's going to watch this prequel, but maybe maybe Henry saw it and just went, no, I don't want any part of this franchise anymore. Well, the, the big part of it was, wasn't he quoted really early on as saying he was going to see it through to the end? Like, that was his yes. open plan, and so it's like, oh, yes. God, what changed, buddy? I have that yeah. quote. Well, he we warned don't us. Watch it. <laughs> we, I think it was a it was a, uh, a Friday Night Tights you were on a couple of years ago when they were filming season two. He came out and warned us all. Lady Graymaster found the clip for me a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, he's straight up saying, like, my sh- my vision and the showrunner's vision don't line up. I am just a carriage on the train. I mean, that's what he's like. He was trying in the best way possible to warn everybody, like, no, nah, this ain't gonna be good. <laughs> Henry is I, I Henry is too that. good a man to be in Hollywood. <laughs> yes, he <laughs> like, is. He's desperately <laughs> trying to. He manages to do the thing right. Of he doesn't want to piss anyone off, and he manages to find a way to do it without coming across as like worthless and spineless. He still gives answers. Like, man, it's real difficult to actually run that line, but he can do it. Yeah. Get that's him a good role. <laughs> yeah. He was born at the wrong time. You know, if he was born 10 years ago, he'd be starring in every movie. He'd be Bond, you know. Right. Yep. I, I, uh, well, I, I remember him. If, if actors actually preferred to, like, come out with their own opinions rather than come out with the same thing. What was the guy? Um, oh, he was in... St- Star Trek, he did a zombie from uh, Peg, Simon Peg. Yeah. Uh, he, when he did that yeah. car thing, and he's like, This is the best movie since whatever it was. <laughs> she Hulk is amazing. I don't know why you uh, all dislike yeah. it. This is not your opinion. And you kept looking off to the side at your windscreen where we know we, what you've been told to say. And you can't even be bothered to lie properly. I'd rather yeah, just wanna... going, ah, you know, I'm, I'm not in charge. You know, it's not my decision. I'm just a cog in a machine. I want to know what caliber of gun was pointed at him off screen. Yeah. Like he looked like a damn <laughs> yeah. He was video. Really, whatever was over there was scary. <laughs> he was like, you know, what did, he's like, it's yeah, a what great did Simon show. Peg, what did he get in return for this? Well, like, like a, what was, <laughs> you can't watch Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead and then have the, the guy who's in the protagonist for both of them be like, oh, yeah, you know, She Hulk. That's pretty good. Yeah, it, it was like it, it had that air of Dan Aykroyd when he was trying to like half-heartedly show for uh, Ghostbusters 2016. Like, yeah. it's it's the funniest thing that I've ever seen. It's way better than the original, and it's scary too. And the actors are great. Like What's that uh, clip of Bill Murray, right, where they ask him why he returned, and he says, "Because I knew these girls were funny." <laughs> <laughs> no way! It rhymed with the that. Car well. I knew I would get a lot of money. That's what he meant to That's say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, guys, yeah, but we we found out, right? It's because he was contractually obligated, and they threatened to sue yep. him. Yep. Yep. Do That's you guys, so fucking hilarious. Like, <laughs> do you, do you guys remember Galaxy Quest when Alan Rickman's character has to say the line? He's like, yeah. "I grab Thar's hammer." <laughs> what a savings, yeah. you know? <laughs> what a savings. Like, like, <laughs> And it's like that's that's Bill Murray in that interview. Yeah. Like, like I that's that's exactly what I thought of. He's just like reading a teleprompter. Like they're so funny. They're I need so to funny. watch that movie. I love Galaxy Quest. Yeah, it's great. Look at Sam Rockwell panicking because he's the red shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what's my name? My <laughs> Do I even have a name? <laughs> Uh, here, here's a really good one actually um, from Gojo who says Critics Choice Award didn't select Paddy Considine as a nominee for Best Actor which is fucking shocking wow alright uh, well, I bet they the score about that one 
did they, did they select the the dude who played uh, Don Lemon in fucking Rings of Power? They did for best actor. I can't believe no, that. They? What the hell? <laughs> I don't, I'm He's trying nominated. To try to, I'm trying He's not nominated. to be mean, right? But it's just like what? Do you, what performance? Like, <laughs> yeah. What what is your criteria for being a good actor? Because it's clearly very different from mine. <laughs> Maybe know? it was best victim on the runway. I don't know. <laughs> that 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 could be it. I, the thing is, I kind of want him to win just so I can see his acceptance speech. Because that will be one of the most r racist things you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> it just, like, repeats it over and over. Considering some of the interviews he's done, um, he is up there with anyone else on that cast. It's just... Yeah. Like, I just oof. love the idea that he wins and he's like, um, yeah, I don't know what, why? <laughs> like, he's looking around. Yeah. <laughs> like, is this a troll? Are you taking the piss out of me? <laughs> is this the rat? <laughs> Uh, I don't, I don't watch award shows anymore, though, so I won't know if he wins anyway. That's I, all right. No do one anymore. does. I can't do you know, the way I discover the answers to all this is just random tweets. We were like, this guy. Right. I just found like that tweet where it's like, Multiverse of Madness has won the best movie. That it's like, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> how did Multiverse. <sighs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, it, you know, fucking Batman and Top Gun. Like, how? How? Maybe it's really specific criteria. Like, I won the award for best Marvel movie to come out in that particular <laughs> month. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, okay, that's all you got. Uh, it, was, it won the award for being the best Doctor Strange movie to come out in 2022. It yeah, did. exactly. Um, yeah, but the thing is, it shouldn't have won for that. Everything, every all at once should have gotten the reward for that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, Doctor Fate was better. That's true too. Uh, here's a, here's a good uh, poignant quote from Joseph's dots. Here it says, "I've been awake since the breaking of the first wind, and in that time, <laughs> I've left many stains." <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence. No, sorry. Yeah. There's there's a whole there's uh, a lot of Jennifer Lawrence in chat right now. There is. Oh my god. I Jennifer Lawrence that. was the first FNT guest. Yeah, she was. I, will, <laughs> uh, I kind of almost hope it's like wait, you, you, you like she says that and you as the interviewer are like wait, say more things, say, talk more about your opinions, <laughs> like tell me more. What else do you think is reality? I need to know. <laughs> It was Viola Davis that was it was interviewing as well. Yes. So. Oh, that makes it even better. She gets all. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. yeah, it looked like she agreed with her when she, she said did. Yeah. That, that boys can't associate with like female characters or whatever. As if you know that what? Was true. It's like Thanks. admittedly, I have a little trouble seeing myself in a a female empowerment story where they're enslaving their own people. I, I have a little trouble with that. <laughs> yeah. That's because you're a it's bigot, Gary. Yeah. It's hard for me too. Yeah, I can't. Can't do it. I tried. I tried, but I can't do it. I watched a Viking show to find representation for myself because I'm very Viking looking, and there was like a woman of color who was their queen. It was weird. Well, yeah, that's because they thought <laughs> they discovered a skeleton 10,000 years ago and it wasn't. <laughs> that's what they based that whole thing off of, which was great. Yeah. Uh, Look it up. Here's Here's another one that's, that we mentioned before. Uh, was Rebel Scum who says, Re Wednesday's gay, by the way. Uh, on the Jim Beam tonight because I like the burn. Have a drink on me, big man. Thank you very much, man. And, uh, oh, you mean the TV the, show? I think the TV like, show? They announced like, the entire Wednesday day is gay. Is what? Gay. <laughs> like, no, the Wednesday, is, <laughs> yeah. Wednesday is gay day, so you actually I have to turn gay for the day. day. Well, I guess it's gay the day now because that used that. to be comic book release day. You so, could, uh, seriously, if all four of you had agreed before this stream to tell me that that's a thing, I would have totally believed you. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's time Maybe to gear it up, boys. Right, when it's officially the day of the gay. Be like, yeah, Jesus okay. Christ, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I loved I loved these articles that were popping up about like the queer baiting in uh in Wednesday. It's oh like my God. You know, you know, it's just this crazy idea that two female characters can just be friends with each other and they don't have to right. instantly need to bang. You oh know, it's God. so bizarre. Like that's what they see now when they, they see characters with, um, like that. Two guys, you don't have like bro ships anymore. It's like, wait, they must yeah. be. It's like, stop, 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 stop. Friendship, remember friendship. This is the annoying thing people do with Lord of the Rings all the time. You know, I'm pretty oh. sure there's something else. It's like, stop, stop. The homoeroticism of Sam and Frodo. Yeah, you can't have friends. You see, it must always be more than that. Well, it's like, yeah, 
for these people, that's all they can see. Like if if all you've got is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, and that's a that's gay nail. Yeah, the gayest of nails, <laughs> and they want to nail it real bad. Mm -hmm. But that's that's how they see the world, I guess, yeah, and that's like that's what they project onto everything. It's a crooked ass nail. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I was watching Predator, and I don't know, Ani, and uh, the, 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 there seemed a bit of gay stuff going on there. You know, I think that's what they were going for. It must have been him and, him and him and Dylan. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was tension there, real tension. I, I, I saw I saw a tweet about Willow, um, the original movie. You know, the two headed dragon, and the guy was like, you know, if Willow was made today, the two headed dragon would just start making out with itself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably would. <laughs> An incestual two-headed dragon. <laughs> I mean, with it, with would that count as masturbation, or would that just be incestual <laughs> masturbation? Technically, it's not cheating, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Within the very oh. first scene of Willow, it's like those two fighting, but they're just talking to each other, and the ginger one is just staring at her lips, like the entire like oh, eyes, yeah, lips, yeah. eyes, lips, eyes, lips, the entire time. They really yeah. want to know before they've even said anything. And there is a scene yeah. in that where. They show, like, they cut every second because there was, a, I can't remember who it was. So they said, like, the more they cut in an action film, the less the actors know how to fight. Because right. that's the only way they yeah. can make them not look bad. But yeah. there's a yeah. scene of that where they're actually fighting and it zooms out so you can see everything for quite a while. And I'm sure they're two men fighting. They, like, yeah. that's why you're so far Probably. back they had on masks a drone. On. Yeah. yeah, they had masks <laughs> on and they, they there go, was like a drone shot. They end up like strategically going so far back you can't even see anything. You just hear you can't see yeah. the roof <laughs> <of> the <shoulders. laughs> they, they move. Yeah. They stand differently. They move differently. And I'm like, I can't call it, but I'm pretty sure. Oh my god! Yeah, Black I Widow, would not be surprised if you go back and like I don't know how many people had to watch Black Widow twice. He's about the bulge. But dude, yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's a bulge. <laughs> there's a uh, like massive shoulders. Uh, it's so obvious, dude. It's how it. <laughs> How the dude what walks. a movie that was! That was, oh was my that 2020 God, or 2021. I can't remember anymore. 2021. Oh, it all blends uh, together. It all blends together. Yeah. Man. That's uh, the decision it. making, though. Like you've you've deliberately done this because you want to prove that women are amazing and strong, and then you cast a man. And, <laughs> at no point yep. does that like contradict <laughs> your worldview or anything. You just don't accept it. It's all fine. I mean, do yeah, but like that these stats. <laughs> okay. Disparate. You're asking the wrong questions because what is a man and what is a woman? Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah. It could be anything. <laughs> now. We, we all liked Black Widow, and then they make a that shit. And then, then they, it, and then they replace it with labor black widow. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I with watched a worse that accent. Hawkeye. It was like, oh, she, yeah, her accent doesn't even sound like. Maybe I don't know enough Russian, so maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It, it's just it, if you asked, it's like if you asked any of us to do a stereotypical Russian accent with no mm -hmm. prep or anything, that's Able what we come Russian. up with without Stage saying the word Russian. Russian. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's exactly what it is. Um, Cody Griffin says Willow is the bestest show ever up there with She-Hulk and Miss Marvel. Just admit it, you gents. <laughs> I, wow. I would admit it's as good as She-Hulk. I yeah, I think I would put it in the same bracket <laughs> for <laughs> sure. It, it makes me angry. There's there's that scene when Princess Kit jumps on her in her sleep and is all like being all romantic and I'm, I'm running away. And I sure I paused it and waxed my carrot, but I was angry about it. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> This is the angriest wank I've ever had, damn it. <laughs> There's literally a line during that scene where she says something on the lines of, you'd make a great knight. I'm like, come on. <laughs> yeah. That is, there's on the nose and then there's that. Yeah, right? The, the first yeah. episode's full of that kind of stuff. Oh my uh, god. Yeah. That's the only one I, I watched the first 20 minutes, dude. It was bad. Yeah, that's all you made it. Twenty minutes. That's it. Yeah, I was like, mm, no, yeah, I, I've watched enough crap. I got through the first episode, but I can't imagine watching this entire series. It is pain. Yeah. It is pain yeah. personified. I had a friend. Yeah, you better have a lot of drink. I had a friend asking why why is Willow coming up in conversations? Like, is the movie getting remastered or something? I was like, no, no, no. It's a TV show. And they're like, what do you mean a TV show? I was like. New it's like they're doing it's like a sequel TV show. They're like, why the fuck? What have they got nothing left to destroy? Like they, they literally ran out of things to kill. They grabbing Willow. Yeah, like, think about it just for a second. When the movie came out, like everybody loved George Lucas. It was unabashed right. love. Ron Howard directed it, and Ron Howard never yep. wanted to work with him again when it was done. <laughs> and they yeah. had no desire to do a sequel because it didn't do that well. It did okay. 
uh, in yeah. the secondary market. Some kids liked it, but it didn't do that well. It was not a well-received film at the time. Yeah, the, the, I think, uh, a friend of mine was also just commenting on, like, of all the franchises that you're digging up to try and benefit from, you've gone for Willow. It's like, what, what is what is next at this point? This is a person well, who's very obsessed with them, hopefully avoiding Back to the Future, and I, I let them know it's like there's a, there is a time on that. There is a, it's, they're going to well, come for it eventually. When Zemeckis well, dies, that's it. Well, Disney, get it. Disney had two high fantasy franchises to choose from to compete with Lord of the Rings, Witcher, and Amazon's Lord of the um, or. Uh, I'm sorry, House of the Dragon, HBO. Yep. And that was Willow and, believe it or not, Dragon Slayer is a Disney movie, right? With Peter McNichol, right? So are you going to do that obscure movie or are you going to do Willow, which is a little more well-known and it's Lucas and mm -hmm. they chose... I, it wouldn't surprise me if they drag Dragon Slayer out and, and bring Peter McNichol back as a cameo or something. It wouldn't surprise me. What, what sucks about all this is like fantasy is like one of my favorite genres and the reason that is, is like it's really hard to do like it's it's yeah. very difficult you know i like some phone book fantasy but i don't like all of it uh right. but like you know you know we're not getting conan elric like some of the classic shit that we should be right. getting because it's too masculine they're trying to make fantasy what something it just flat out isn't which is uh feminist famous fantasy it doesn't exist it's not it, it won't work it's a square peg in a round hole all right wasn't there a conan though supposed to be amazon had it uh, like a for a yeah. time yeah, that's uh, right. been on it and is, off for ages. It was, yeah. it was, the rights were obtained by the same people who obtained the rights to Invincible, uh, Walking right. Dead, and another network prior to that. Um, the boys, uh, they they were they they left. One was unceremoniously uh, shot out the door for reasons uh, and uh, uh, possibly a false me too, and then right. the other one quit later on. And then Jennifer Salky came in. And shit canned Conan and Midnight had, had done great videos on this. Yeah, uh, they have. Miguel Sapochnik and Ryan Kandel. And like, by all accounts, this series was going to be killer. It was going to be like right. real Conan. Ah, yeah. we lost Proper that. Conan. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh, but well. it's because oh, man. You, you can't do fantasy without traditional values. Because this right. is a world without sort of society or anyone to protect you. And so everyone reverts back to essentially your evolutionary Barbarism. traits. So the men have to be men because they have to protect the women, otherwise everything gets destroyed. And you yeah. can do variations on that, but unless you have that core value of this is sort of base humanity and value, like core principles of what it means to be human, it doesn't work. And but then so, you get, yeah, you get to something like Willow where it tries to force yeah. that shit in and it just feels yeah. so fake and so like contrived. Yeah. yeah, that's why it doesn't feel realistic because you're like none of these people could physically exist in this universe, and that will always pull you out of it. You'll never get immersed. Yeah, yeah. I I can't watch Willow and think Princess Kit could totally like whip a grown ass man in battle, <laughs> like a, wearing <laughs> armor. He has like a battle axe. He's like a seven foot tall Viking, and she's all like poking him with her little sword. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I could totally buy that. They're so desperate to humiliate the men in it as well. Not only in like what you saw from the first episode, but in the third one, there's a bit where Willow is trying to save the day. So he makes like a smoke bomb in the middle of a fight. He yeah. lobs the smoke bomb and they use the smoke as cover to kidnap the princess that they're trying to protect. So he literally like destroys his own team and loses the fight yeah. for him. And like, oh. <laughs> they made him incompetent and mean. Like when the when the little prince that's kind of a weakling, but he's really smart, he's talking about how bad magic like corrupts the soul. And Willow straight up is all like, when did you become high Nelwyn? Oh, that's right. You're fucking not. And I'm like, what the? Yeah. He, it's literally he was only a title. Smart. It's only a title, yeah. which is applicable is... to them in their cave. <laughs> can, I, can, I ask, can I ask as well, is Willow living alone on an island somewhere um, and just wishing that everyone would leave him alone so that he can die <laughs> in <laughs> peace? I mean, he's in a cave with all the other Nelwins because he can't yeah. protect them so they had to go and hide from the world and he shows up That's at the end far of the episode <laughs> right end of the first yeah. episode so you get largely the first episode is like no well like it's it's also yeah he's yeah, in the rest a, but the humiliating. yeah he he shows up at the end and does like a massive exposition dump that doesn't sound good when he performs the line it's all like your brother is still alive and he's across the great sea in the immemorial city and they're and it's like oh Oh, it's it's some of the worst acting I've ever seen, and I like Warwick Davis. Uh, the only character I seem to really like, his a bit part, is Warwick Davis' actual daughter, 
plays Mims, his daughter in the the original movie, all grown up. She did fine, you know. It, it was fun to kind of see it um, kind of play out as a father-daughter kind of situation where she's giving him advice. And that was okay, but that, that's kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel on this show. It's it's pretty terrible. If you if you guys watch more than 20 minutes of it, it'll get worse. Yeah, Trust we're me. at the point where when we're critiquing shows that we just know are complete garbage, right? We're still trying to fight like, okay, there was like two minutes where somebody delivered their lines believably. You know, yeah. I, like, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, Tisa didn't completely offend me for three minutes or just, you know, make me want to cringe or whatever in, in right. a in a uh, 50 hour first season show sorry it's right it's, well, it's yeah we're, we're now at the like yeah the lowest possible benchmark of like someone right. said some words that like didn't sound completely ridiculous so yay yeah. good on them Way, yay <laughs> yeah. there you go it's why we, i don't we, give people points for not being something it's like because yeah. i consider that to be the baseline and then i go from how much you've entertained me since right. then well, and- we we had an interesting conversation with uh, with Chris Gore earlier when he was on talking about Avatar too, and like he, you know, he's he's of the mindset of like it's atrociously written and like really weak in terms of like character and dialogue and storytelling, but it looks fantastic and it's probably going to captivate people, um, and you know it it's uh, it's probably going to ultimately do really well because it's it's given them at least some kind of like traditional values that they can enjoy um but that's the benchmark it's like it's good because everything else is bad right and it it's a weird position to be in now <sighs> yeah especially as somebody who grew up just loving film i love film so much i'm trying to make my own little movies and stuff because i love film so much and i love this this storytelling through film and video games and stuff and it just it sucks that i have nothing new to watch i always end up going back and watch older shit because every time i check out something new it's like what are they going to hit me with this time well, that's the yeah. biggest problem, right? The people who love film and want to make it aren't working in Hollywood anymore. They're they're outnumbered by the people who want to use it as a, as a platform for their politics or just to be famous or just to get clout. And there's always been that with actors, but there's always been a subsect of like actual creative people who just freaking love film and want to make film and a bunch of dorks and yeah. in the best way, right? Uh, and right. that's getting that, you know, and their farm system, the independent system has just been wiped out, you know, absolutely wiped out. So now it, they, they aren't even doing that. They're just going there. I mean, I have heard story after story of uh, bringing somebody in from an a, a accountant position. This is at this was at Disney uh, to produce a certain project. She, she's an accountant. She had never produced anything, but she's a black female. So they made her a producer. And guess what? She flamed out and ended up losing her job. And became one of those cases where, oh, you just cast me in this role and it didn't work out because I was inexperienced and now I lost my job. You know, right. uh, as more and more of that happens, hopefully this will change. But like, dude, right now, Hollywood is missing people like you, uh, people like Chris or, or like me. We're getting old, you know, and there's not enough. Uh, they're not bringing in an, an, enough new talent. So so their big their big uh, solution to this is to hire TikTokers to create. Content. Right. Video. Yeah, that'll do it. I make videos that'll, for people with a nine cents of detention span on the high end. Yeah, yeah that's. That. It takes so long for me to produce videos because I have makeup and lighting effects and you know camera work to do and scripts and just to do a little three minute joke video where I cast a spell and grow boobs by accident. You know, it's just it's stupid comedy, but I enjoy it. And yeah. it takes me so long that I can't pump out the content. I can't do it. I can't compete with that crowd i can't i can't do three videos a day i, I can't do it and so you know uh, like places like youtube and tiktok they promote quantity over quality these days i mean there's still Gosh. artists there but they're just outnumbered man they're completely yeah. outnumbered by producers and bankers and activists and everything else yep. well, how else are they going to replace them like if if hollywood's in california if someone loses their job they put out a job advert who's most likely to apply someone from california what you've mm-hmm, ended up right. with is an area which all agree with each other. And so, yeah, it's too essentially, unless you're going to move or recruit people from the rest of the country, which has different views, you're always going to just replace them with someone who thinks exactly the same. And the, this right. is, the movie, like what you described, is very similar to how gaming used to be. So if you go back to the 90s, games were created because 
it was like a one or two man band who wanted to make something that didn't exist so they made the game that yeah. they wanted to play and like you've got sort of like dwarf fortress which is a game that people have worked on for 20 years it's their life's yeah. work uh, because yeah. no yeah. game existed like that and they wanted to play it and you just right. don't get that kind of um commitment anymore everything's even in gaming it's a conveyor belt for stuff everything's got to be what? done out the door people you're, you're kind of a job, like, not a... you're you're kind of priced out the market now as a games yes. developer because unless you've got like 50 million dollars to sink into a game you're not going to be able to produce any kind of like top tier title that like right. large numbers of people are going to um, get to appreciate um the the days when you could just program a game in your fucking bedroom in your spare time are just over sadly it just doesn't work like that anymore they're too um, complicated it, it's the death yeah, of the like originality and creativity yes. mm -hmm. like if you took vr vr was something that one man bands could go into because the graphics didn't need to be amazing you just needed stuff with high fps and so anyone could make one and that led to a whole new way of rendering where they uncoupled your mouse movement from the generation of the screen so everything feels like it's like 240 FPS, no matter how high or low it is. And right. anyone could have come up with that. It didn't bother though. They were just like, eh, buy a new graphics no. card, it's fine. I, I ran across an interesting substack. I'm going to go over it mostly tomorrow. Uh, going off of memory, just based on what we were talking about today. Award shows, all of them collectively, uh, viewership is down 70%. Yep. 70%. So all the, all the systems Damn. that Hollywood relied on, um, licensing deals. You know, like Doctor Who would license individual deals in individual countries and get individual checks from that. Now they're going to bring everything on a streaming service and lose it all. Um, they, uh, toy licensing is not that good. Um, you don't have a healthy movie market anymore. You don't have a healthy DVD or physical uh, media market. I mean, these are all revenue streams that are gone, and a subscription is not going to cover it. And Hollywood no. is right. Out. So the money has dried up, and I was at uh, – I was at I was hanging out with Chris in LA and we were talking to one of his friends who works in the industry. He just got back and he's like, Yeah, studio just like canceled 35 projects. Like things are getting canceled <sighs> left Damn. and right. Not half of them, but one studio, 35 projects. So like the the chickens are coming home to roost in Hollywood, and it's it's gonna be really bad. And they uh and he brought up what else did he bring up? Uh like Netflix is in bad shape, even though Wednesday's doing good, they've got nothing. Really, uh, dude, did you hear Mahler? They lost um, Midnight Mass. Oh, uh, uh, Midnight Mass. Yeah, Flanagan. They lost Flanagan. Like, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know he like he posted basically all of his plans for season two, just the entire story, because uh, he was it, he. That's one of the most blatant. Like, believe me, they are not allowing a second season. That's never happening. It is done, dead, and gone. That IP. And here, here is he. Basically, was like, here are the spoilers. Because uh, it's never happening. And it's kind of sad. I read it, and you could tell he had a lot of passion for that project. I did say I did check it out. It was fine. It was it was, it was fine. And I can imagine it because Midnight Mass made huge waves. Everyone talked about Midnight Mass. And yeah, so it was I good. Think, yeah. Yeah. But the money's drying up. So like that's why you know they're gonna let something somebody like him go. Uh, and they'll He's over let, to Amazon uh, now, right? Yeah, and Amazon's gonna drown for a little while. You know they've got they've got liquid. But I mean, they don't, you know, Apple has liquid too, but they still need to, like, these are just pet projects. One's a phone company. The other one is a mail order company. They're, they're not streaming. They're not entertainment companies. You got to keep this in mind. And it will just be something they get bored of if it doesn't start generating. They're, they're into it now, but how many times have we seen this? You know, I'll always go back to Disney back in the 90s. Bought the, the uh, Anaheim Ducks, right? They bought the Anaheim right. Ducks, the hockey team. And they bought I remember the that and the big A, and they were going to get in the sports, and all the corporate, uh, you know, big corporations were going to get in the sports. Then they found out, oh, this this is not a money generator. This is a nope. play thing for billionaires. Uh, and they had to get out of it. And I think the same thing will happen with a lot of these big corporations with their IPs. They'll start selling some off. You know, I'm not saying uh, Disney will ever sell Marvel or Star Wars. I don't think so. But they might, like, uh, maybe they get, maybe it gets bad, bad enough where they license it out. Um, and that's what um, uh, Zaslav said with with WB, right? We're not against licensing stuff out, you know? Right. Uh, I assume what we were seeing here over the past couple of years was like a gold rush for streaming where they were rushing to get as many IPs as possible and get as many, like as many pieces of content out there as possible to try and be the dominant streaming service and push everyone else out. Because once you achieve that monopoly, then you can charge basically whatever you want for it. 
but it's not happened. And yeah. so, like, they've just wasted immense amounts of money trying to prevail. Um, I mean, yeah, we can talk for a while about, like, streaming and the Endeavor and how much it was a bit of a... They, they clearly wanted more out of it than it was even going to be able to give. But how I would love to see the timeline where all these IPs weren't burned and destroyed, that they came out with really good installments. It'd be really curious to see how everything looks if everything was fucking so, worthwhile. on that... Mahler, you're absolutely <laughs> yeah. right. Like the the biggest problem that all of us here have been talking about for varying degrees of time is woke Hollywood. I know the word woke still upsets some people, but it's openly being talked about in Hollywood now, like openly by CEOs, sure. by, by the media. They are now openly talking about this. Like maybe this is a problem. They haven't gotten there yet. Don't get me wrong. They got a ways to go, but they're starting to openly talk about in that little piece of paper. I, I shared earlier that had this, which were which was a Writers Guild of America Zoom meeting that people, a lot of people, a lot of good people have done videos on, uh, where they said they are going to reinterpret legacy characters in a new queer light. But I mean, dude, there's other individual meetings that do the same thing for each identity. Uh, the only one I'm missing is in, interpreting male characters into a female light, but I'm sure it happened. Absolutely Why do you collect sure those happens. things like Pokemon cards or something? You can now. Like, <laughs> gotta catch them all. That's what Hollywood's doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Gotta catch them all. I was going to say, by the way... Uh, it's nice to see what we what we knew all along, just verified and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, we, we knew what you were up to. But to see it like in like hard format, damn, man. Um, yeah, to the point where the guy didn't want to email it, right? <laughs> he printed it out because uh, he didn't want to trace and you know, he didn't like, want to get yeah. kicked out of the WGA, which I don't blame him for. And I thank him profusely for, like, everything he did and being, like, having the balls enough to, to show us this. Because, like, this was on YouTube, but it goes under the radar because nobody actually cares about this. If they did, then that video would have, at the time, when I first discovered it, it had a couple hundred views. It's got, you know, a couple thousand now and a bad, really horrible ratio. But, uh, yeah, they, they're... They're not doing this stuff like hidden. They're, they're, this is in plain sight. We just got to look for it, you know. And it's horrible. It's horrible. And 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 constantly, I'm sure you, everybody gets it here. Like it's just like I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing, but uh, I can't say anything. But keep it up. Keep up the fight, which yeah. is great. But as all of us have said, we need to hear it from you, not from us. Then you know, ultimately, I would love to be able to snap my fingers and change everything, but I, I can't. I uh, don't have that power. Uh, but you know what? People who work in the industry do. You're the ones actually working. You're the workers. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Yeah. Well, I, I have a friend uh, who kind of works in that industry. His name's Undoomed. And to this day, he still has never shown his face because he's a, he needs his work. You know? He's mm -hmm. like yeah. a, an editor or whatever. You know, like he, he edits films. And um, I, I love talking with the guy, man. He's a fun guy to stream with. And you guys probably get a kick out of some of the, you know, some of the industry stuff, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's a perfect example. Like he can't show his face. He'd never get work again. Yeah. Because he has so, the wrong opinions. It's a hell of a position to be in. But that seems yeah. to be the culture still at the moment. You just have to hope that it'll eventually change. Um, they I'll get... I've heard stories that even like um, casting agents will look at who you follow on Twitter. If I you're like going up for a role, like if you're going in for a role and you're you wanting to get this movie or TV show and you really want the role, they'll look you up on Twitter. And if you're following like, like, like James Woods, yeah, that is absolutely you know? true. There is a yeah. certain movie star who was uh, told not to follow people and and. And wouldn't i'll just i gotta leave it there <laughs> but there's a certain movie. i will, I will ask yeah. no thank you. That, that absolutely happens i that shouldn't i mean again it, it maybe it, it does sound surprising but at this point like things have gotten we're so deep in the clown world <laughs> it shouldn't it, be. it's it's just it's like living in the soviet union in the 1950s or something like you've got to be constantly policing your own like words and your own thoughts for wrong think you know to to be existing in that environment because it's like if i even like listen to the wrong person if i'm seen talking to the wrong person that's it i'm done i'm yep. uh, i'm finished um yeah what an environment to live that. in 
Hollywood can't sustain on that with people telling on each other and watching your fucking neighbors, aka other celebrities in your, you know, in your gated communities, millionaires, you know, but they're still policing each other. It can't be sustainable, can it? It's got to collapse eventually. No, I would hope so. Telling you how to fuck off isn't sustainable either, you know. Uh, no, that's art, true. art isn't the domain of of the leftist. It's not, and it can't survive without with, with just you know specializing. Uh, we, we, they found that out with bros. They found that out with bros. That was their right. big lesson. Uh, yeah, that was a, that too. That was I mean, a big flop, killed, wouldn't it? Yep, it killed comedy in the UK. I remember when I was a teenager, I used to think British comedy was the best in the world. I used to watch all the comedy shows, the panel shows, the stand up, and everything else. I just don't watch it anymore because it's not funny. And it's not like it changed. The people are the same people that were there when I was a teenager. It's just all of their comedy has changed. They don't say anything offensive. There are people that actually got yeeted off um, the BBC at one point and came back. And now they say entirely different things. They're all down the line, straight down the line. Their opinions have changed. And it, it just can't be funny because comedy inevitably has to push boundaries or it's not funny. Yep. And well, right. the, the very notion of... Been taken on it. You, the very notion of BBC comedy is like a, an oxymoron right now. It's <laughs> yeah. just like they, they can't produce anything funny because they won't dare to do anything remotely what do you controversial. Mean? They've been making plenty of recently. Oh! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish on, a, on a, a more positive note here. Well, hopefully, it depends on our answer, but from Patty P, they ask uh, Hail Panel, any movies or TV shows that you're looking forward to in the new year? Highlander remake, anyone? Nah, not so much that, but is there anything that we're looking forward to? So there was a mention of um, Flanagan going to Amazon. Apparently he's making a Dark Tower series. Now, oh, dear. a friend of mine is like, woohoo, because they like Flanagan, but I had to warn them. I was like, he's not the one you want to adapt something usually. He's not very faithful. Like, he'll he'll change something to whatever he wants it to be. So, like, if you're looking for something authentic to Dark Tower, I'm not sure you're going to get it from that. So, And it's on Amazon, too. You might want to, like, it's, you know. So, yeah, that'll be something you have to wait for, like, production notes and trailers, I guess. Um, but in terms of excitement for movies and, well, I mean, you guys are all hyped for the new Ant-Man, right? So hyped. I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> no, I've got one. I, I am... Woo. Genuinely I want to see. The, I want to see the Wasp and Ant Man. Yeah, <laughs> they switched it. Can't be the Ant Man and Wasp anymore. No, no. Well, yeah. look at the poster. You know, from the last movie, uh, the Marvels. Yeah. The Marvels. I am. I've got a countdown oh. clock ticking down to the Marvels. Can't wait. Oh, Gary, did you <laughs> I, I legit. How, um, there's only 500 pages left to write for Winds of Winter. Apparently. Oh yeah, I uh, I did the math without X Ray Girl, um, and. It's going to be four point. I, I, I made a mistake in my tweet, but it was a, that, well, my message to people. But it's uh, going to be another four point eight four years. Uh, <laughs> four point, I did the math, uh, if, based on like the twelve hundred pages he's already written, and I, I, he said eleven to twelve hundred pages, so I gave it to twelve hundred pages. It's going to be four point eight four. You should have said that like if he like, dies, dies, time doubles. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be like <laughs> soon. You've got to allow like time for edits, rewrites, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's That's gonna, gonna be, be a long time. TV series. Might slow down. It's yeah, gonna be surreal what? if that book actually launches. We're all be like, oh shit, look who it is. Dear oh, God. Dude, uh, you know, I'll I'll buy it and read it. I will <laughs> buy it and read the shit out of it. Uh, knowing that I'm never going to get a fa like, oh, God, I'm just. A yeah, they're not going to remake season eight, are they? So. No, they, yeah, I think they, they can remake gonna, Game of Thrones yeah, someday. They're going to remake the whole thing. Then yeah, even just though, remake the whole thing. Right? All the fans would have been happy. That, you know what? I'll even allow you to call it a fucking timeline B, whatever. Let, I don't even need it to be the prime one, quote unquote. But just yeah. give us a second. Uh, After Halo, season. just you're just to say it, like the the whole oh. the original one was just a, a warg dream of Bran while he was like <laughs> warged off his tits. <laughs> and, like, yeah, right. This is the real only one. Do it, well, if they say like no, uh, our first one is the canon one. You guys can have this fan fiction one. We'll make for you, but according to what you want, I'd be like, fine, fine. We yeah, all know who they consider what canon. They, they can actually right. incorporate the werewood paste that they never really did with Bran. So it's like you get this paste of werewood and it looks like there's blood in it, but I mean, some they, people think it's Jojen. They could just tell a story. That would be neat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Balls. That, would be, that would be nice. 
That, we're so uh, easy hey, to please. The John Snow series. The John Snow series oh. will fix it all. That guy, oh, it will, okay. it, dude, if that ends up being good, it will be funny because they, they clearly had a huge meeting about how shit season eight was. They're like, whatever the hell you guys did, we need to not do that. Oh, there's a story. Like, he could go, he, like, he went north, right? And he can go to the, uh, well, he can just keep going and go to Essos, end up in Essos, and just be kind of like the last Targaryen, you know, walking yeah, can, or wandering around a part of the world we've never seen. They'll bait Arya coming back into the show, and then they'll go back to Westeros, see, well, King's Landing, and find out things aren't great. Bran isn't, a, Bran isn't working out as king. They're like, oh, Game of Thrones Series 2, Part 1. <laughs> yeah. is, you, you could probably get all the actors back as well, because none of them are particularly busy these days. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they ran out of Marvel projects. Uh, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, I remember when Tyrion ended up in, like, you know, Nidavellir, right? That's where he was in the MCU. And it's just like, oh, look at you go. You, you move it up. And then it's like, what else you done? It's like, um. Elf. <laughs> well, he refused. <laughs> <laughs> He, did, remember, he got very upset about Snow White. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say yeah. he could do the Seven Dwarf yeah. movie if he didn't get annoyed. Though. He he right. got so upset they got rid of the dwarves. <laughs> he <laughs> got them rid of them, and, the, and then the dwarves In attacked Snow him because and the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> the dwarves yeah. attacked him because like that was seven jobs we could have had. And <laughs> you got yeah. us fired, right, the so he got kicked back from the same people he was defending. I, I say <laughs> let let them fight it out in some kind of arena so we oh, can all watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Midget <laughs> wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's YouTube videos. Yeah. The, dwar the dwarven community is act actor Peter Dinklage. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> throw, throw in Jello and I'm in, baby. <laughs> uh, well, listen, I think yeah, we've been going for ages tonight, and uh, yeah. we've we've kind of run out of time. Um, I know, like uh, yeah. We're not going. We're not getting through all the super chats tonight, but we will do a catch up stream as always. And uh, I want to say thank you to all my fantastic guests tonight. Uh, thanks, Disbrew, for coming back. Thank you, Magog, for coming in for the first time. It's been great to have you on, man. And thank you, thank Gary. You. You're a late arrival, but you're always fucking welcome here, sir. Thanks for the invite, man. It was fun. That's been great. Thank thanks, you, man. Pat. And uh, yeah, thank you for chat. Thank you for all your lovely super chats as well. You've been super generous as always. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. So for now, at least, that's all we got for today. So go away. Bye. See ya.